Uh, good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, October 10th, the regular scheduled meeting of the Board of Commissioners. Um, and this morning, we're blessed to have uh, Reverend Ike Reckert give us the, the benediction and followed by Officer Keishla Tab to the allegiance and the pledge. So those who are willing and able to stand, please do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, a brand new day for us in our lives, each and every one of us. We only have that 24 hours within a day, and we're thankful that you give us the opportunity to be able to live out those moments and to be able to make a life. I thank you for our community. I thank you for it being an amazing place to be able to work, to be able to play, to be able to raise your family. I thank you for our commissioners, each and every one of them, as they go about sometimes the very arduous and very difficult task of being able to help us as a community, to be able to take on all the different challenges that are out there before us in a rapidly growing community. So, Lord, thanks for all of your blessings today. We're honored to be in this place, and uh, we do so today as your children and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you both for doing that, starting off this, uh, this, uh, this meeting. And... We have a, uh, a small, I'll check one thing here. We've added uh, an item to the consent agenda. Is everybody aware of that? Item number 35, you all have that in your books? Okay. Mm -hmm. And for the public also, we've added a, uh, a consent agenda item to item, item number 35, which involves some litigation. Okay. With that, I, I think, yes, we are. There's two of them that move to consent. Yeah, right. Well, we're going to consent. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is a little bit of change. We're going to have uh, public public uh, speakers first, and then we're going to go to the consent agenda. And then um, we're having a hearing later in the, after, uh, in the meeting. So if you're here about the meeting, what we've done is we've moved that those six slots up before the, uh, the hearing. So if you want to wait until then to address your remarks, uh, we made arrangements for that. So with that... <coughs> Your first speaker is David Birkenbein. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. Your name is David Birkenbein, and I'm speaking on the medical burn ban. I left last month saying that this law hurt me, hurt my family, and it hurt 51 other people that have medical burn ban this year by the interpretations your first enforcement thought up and was engraved over the years, and hopefully this will be changed. I want you to understand that people of the medical bird ban, we are and were productive giving families to our community and the world. We are not excess baggage or expendable people. We, have, we were given a law to help relieve our situation and its interpretation having been overstated, at the same time, you gave a law and then you condone its nullification. That's crazy to me by the interpretation. I'm not a lawyer, Mr. Chairman, just like you and I stated in previous meetings, but all the questions I've asked and the clarifications you were supposed to get, I have yet received an answer and what am I whether I'm reading and understanding this laws and regulations wrong, and I get no answers. As such, when Chairman Lee was in charge, his secretary responded to my email. When I asked a question, she emailed five other people. And guess what? No response. Are you really serious? Maybe I have to go through this dialogue to get answers, so be it. But at least in the near future, we'll be discussing this medical burn ban and its meaning and enforcement of my story and my fight for proper enforcement for the other 51 people in medical burn ban will continue. 
In the meantime, don't forget the wording in your law and your quick reference guide that the fire marshal put out. Even though you follow all the rules in the, in the burning, you may have to put the fire out if it adversely affects people that are uh, affected by smoke. I handed out a brochure just as a quick reference for you all so you don't have to look it up on the internet. Also, the fire marshal can, can extinguish any fire. It doesn't stipulate what kind of fire, any fire. And then you gave the fire marshal the uh, authority to, in a geographical area, to give people relief that have a medical problem that's adversely affected by smoke. I have a driver's license. I have my Georgia weapons carry license, and I had to fill out an application, just like I had to fill out an application for a medical burn ban. I have laws that require me to do certain things carrying these two cards. But with this law for the medical burn ban, I have nothing because they'll come out and they won't put a fire out. Who are they to determine whether that smoke is affecting the person in the medical burn ban? What gives them the right when a person calls up that has a medical burn ban and you have to go out there and with the fire department and you show them? Well, it's legal. Why? Because it says it right here. The chimneys, outdoor fire pits, uh, burn pans, whatever you want out there. So that carries more weight than the law does. That's crazy. Just because they wanted to make people happy. And when I talk about ingrained, somebody thought about way back in 2006 before y'all even got here, this medical burn ban upset a lot of people, a lot of people that's even in charge. Your fire marshal told me that it was a loophole that, you, that the board didn't take care of. Well, I'm, I'm here, hopefully, to where we can take care of it. He works for you. He works for me. He saw the flaw. So I don't know, when, when you all decide on this medical burn ban, use a lot of discernment on what's written and what you're hearing. Because if I'm, if I'm right, we need to protect these people. Thank you. Uh, David, don't go anywhere, please. Uh, the card, I didn't quite get the, the, the issue about the card. Your oh, driver's license? Yeah, my driver's license. Yeah. What, yeah, I have certain things I got to follow through. Right. Well, I had to apply for medical burn ban. Right. Well, I had a certain things that I had to apply for that under penalty, apparently, that I am affected by okay. All right. smoke. So you're not asking us to issue a card for that, are you? No, no. Okay, all right. The second thing is, uh, I, reg I regularly read my emails, and I'm kind of surprised. I haven't seen anything from you in a couple of weeks, so I must have missed something. So what I'd like you to do is uh, Judy Solomon right there is, uh, is uh, one of my executive assistants. I want you to talk to her after some time before you leave today and schedule a meeting with you, um, Commissioner uh, Weatherford and, um, and Mr. Kreider, and I want to address your topics, all right, because... I'll admire you for your persistence, and they're going to be rewarded with this meeting, I think. I'm not quite sure what we're not doing. I know we've done a lot of things already, but clearly you think we're not doing everything. So I want to make sure we get this all addressed at least. Right, uh, and, I, and, I, and okay. I appreciate Okay, you know. all right. So get with Judy, and she'll work a meeting here. Probably won't be till November, all right? Well, that's but, fine. But I want to make sure that we stay on and talk about your points there because I'm there are patient. a couple things you said today that I'm not quite sure. Um, I found out that when you have you sit down together – and talk about these issues, a lot of things are cleared up. So uh, I think we're all trying to do the right thing here, but we're not all speaking at the same forum. This will be an opportunity to do that, okay? That's fine. All right, thanks, David. Thank you. Sure. The next speaker is Larry Gore. Thank you, folks, for hearing me today. Thank you for working for us. Lisa's my... Uh, commissioner. I'm Larry Gore. I live at Covenant Place uh, in Powder Springs. It's Cobb County, Georgia. Uh, Covenant Place is designated as a conservation subdivision. I believe we're the only one in Cobb County. I may be wrong on that. Uh, we are an overlay community. 
designated by Cobb County. We were established by Cobb County in 2004 by Z104. Uh, in addition to my annotated grievances, please accept my oral remarks as part of these grievances. I reserve the right to revise and amend them. Uh, the premise of this, these grievances is the developer shall have clean and marketable title, no encumbrances to the land within the development. <coughs> if any variance exists between the drawing and the commissioner's annotated notes, the notes will prevail. Grievance number one is the dam. Cobb Commissioner's notes under drainage comments, additional comments, slash suggestions. Note eight, the dam shall be cleared of all trees and repaired and grassed according to safe dams directions as part of the subdivision development. Dam and lake cannot be eliminated without comparable stormwater control and water quality benefits returned. The work was never accomplished, not done. So who in the county government has allowed this to happen? Who in the county government will cause corrective action? Grievance number two is a head wall and drainage at rear of the dam. I'll say this two or three times. Covenant Place is a conservation subdivision with a lake and a dam. We are an overlay development. Platts defining nature areas, nature trails, pedestrian easement access, and open space entries. Not developed, not signed, not fenced, not sound buffered, and the berm along Moon Road is incomplete. Reference Commissioner's Note 8-B with respect to lots located adjacent to Moon Road. The applicant will construct a six to eight foot landscape an irrigated berm along said frontage. Said berm shall be planted with 10 to 12 magnolia trees and other flowering trees, evergreens, and shrubs subject to the arborist review and approval. The landscape berm shall be uh, irrigated and the upkeep and maintenance of same shall be the responsibility of the Mandatory Homeowners Association. Reference CD 50 uh, 5019, note 20. All erosion and sediment control measures where temporary or permanent shall be maintained by the permittee or exempt person until the area affected by such areas are permanently stabilized. Code 134-102-2, supplemental 15, note 9. Pedestrian easements shall be minimum of 15 feet wide and provide with, provided when necessary to allow access to common areas for all residents. Easements should be signed as access points. Reference CD 5019-19, hazardous conditions at sediment basins and floodwater retention structures <laughs> shall be fenced and posted to avoid danger to life or property. Without done. Grievance number three, dam, lake, and trail access. Approximately 27 lots are lake lots. Approximately 47 are non-lake lots. I'm probably off by one both ways on that. Non-lake lots have no access to the lake and dam without putting their life in peril. A, a site inspection will show why. I'll volunteer as a guide. Uh, we do not have equal access to all planned amenities, primarily because the dam was never repaired and access points for trails and open spaces entries have not been completed. The original dock was usable until about two years ago, but due to a lack of maintenance, it is of little use. In addition, our sidewalk fronting Moon Road was one of the projects funded by the 2006 local option sales tax where it became difficult for DOT to build a build at Powder Springs Creek. DOT ran the sidewalk into Moon Road and placed a guardrail so as to position uh, pedestrians on the same side as auto traffic. Part of this rail blocks access to our green space. I requested budget for DOT through Lisa's office. I don't know when that work will be started. 
Our upstream neighbors were authorized by 2004 Z138 and is near build out. Nature trails between these communities have not been started. Reference section 134-198-2, Conservation Subdivision Districts A, Purpose and Intent. Sir, you've got your time uh, and then some. I guess my question is, have you caught Dana? Dana here? Has he, has he contacted your office about these issues? Yes, sir. Okay, so. Several times. All right, so what's the, what's, I'm, I'm guessing it's another side to the story? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> I'd like to hear it during, after, after the commentary, or I don't want to take more, yeah, we got other public comment here, but I just, I, I want to hear what's going on here. Yes, because, that's the purpose. All right, okay. And have you contact, yeah. and have you talked also with Commissioner Cupid about this? Yes. Okay. I talked to her office, not to her. Uh, called her office several times. Uh, all talked right. Okay. With her assistant. Well, I'm going to ask your patience. All right. And yes. We'll, we'll get to you during this hearing Patient sometime. I'll come talk to you. All right. Yeah. May I present Chair, a copy? Yes, please. Sure. Go ahead. Get a, Thank you. That's what I was going to request. Do I, I meet with Dana? If you want, please. Yes. The next speaker is Cynthia Patterson. Good morning, Board of Commissioners. My name is Cynthia Patterson, and I live in District 2. July 1864, the Confederate Army desperately tries to prevent Union troops from crossing the Chattahoochee River and capturing Atlanta. Under the direction of General Johnston, a six to seven mile fortified line is constructed along the Chattahoochee. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Fast forward to today. Six acres of green space, two forts, and a trench remain as artifacts from the Chattahoochee River line, one of the most impressive defensive fortifications ever constructed. The Point at Providence is a housing development located within the Chattahoochee River line. The threatened six acres is adjacent to the Providence Clubhouse. Holty Homes wants to build 44 single family houses on the historic six acres, which is currently zoned for 138 condominiums. The Chattahoochee River line is recognized by the National Register of Historic Places. Cobb County owns a 23-acre Civil War battlefield site across Veterans Memorial Highway from Providence. The important Providence military earthworks could be candidates for the National Register of Historic Places also. The Chattahoochee River line is nationally significant. The group of Civil War earthquakes and green space would foster a unique sense of place and history in the neighborhood. Preserving all six acres as a historic site increases the visibility of the river line historic area. Irreplaceable historic earthworks would be preserved in perpetuity. Much needed green space increases property values, reduces storm water, water runoff, provides shade and wildlife habitat. Unaltered viewshed makes it more attractive to the National Register of Historic Places. Mableton is recognized as a travel destination for Civil War enthusiasts, attracting US and international history buffs. Cobb County and Pulte Homes cooperated in the past to create Chupade Park on Oakdale Road. The two acre park protects unique Chupade forts, a trench and a redan. Through the rezoning process, commissioners required Pulte Homes to preserve the Civil War earthworks at the Park Avenue housing development please offer the same protection to the six acres at Providence. 
I urge Pulte Homes to work with the commissioners to protect the unique six acres. Pulte Homes recognized the importance of Civil War history preserved in Chupade Park. Their brochure states, quote, here you'll do more than enjoy an incredible home and superb community. You'll have a unique opportunity to live on a Civil War site, end quote. Offer the same priceless amenity to residents of Providence. I urge the commissioners to designate the six acre parcel for historic preservation and green space. Identify and fence the county's 50 foot buffer zone around the historic elements to prevent more damage to the earthworks. Thank you. The next speaker is Roberta Cook. Good morning, Chairman Boyce and Commissioners. My name is Roberta Cook from Mableton in District 4, and I couldn't have asked for a better introduction than uh, what Cynthia has talked about today. I'm going to be speaking as founder and executive director of the Riverline Historic Area, a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. My objective is to gain your appreciation for the historic area and request your assistance in preserving the six acres, as uh, Cynthia had mentioned, containing two Civil War forts and a trench line during an upcoming November 21st zoning hearing, which is identified as other business item number 40 involving the Pulte Providence subdivision. As you can see on the map that's been distributed to you, um, our mission is at the top. The Riverline Historic Area embraces historic and natural resources. Near the Chattahoochee River to unite the community as a place of distinction. And at the bottom, it describes the area that we cover. We, we're linking Vinings, Smyrna, and Mableton, Georgia. Just to get your bearings, the Chattahoochee, this area borders the Chattahoochee River. It transcends both District 4 to the south and District 2 on the north. Um, this big white line down the middle is 285, and the major roadways are Atlanta Road, uh, South Cobb Drive, and down to the south here, Veterans Memorial Highway. Our most prominent historic resources in the Seven Mile Historic Area which is designated in this light gray area, are the remaining trenches and forts from the 1864 Chattahoochee Riverline Battlefield. Cobb County documented all those earthworks, which are indicated on this map as red lines and blue lines. The red line was the last defense line in Cobb County uh, during the war. Um, the Riverline Historic Area is using time capsules of battlefield remains nestled in the woodlands to unify our community with history and green space while creating an identity and sense of place. The city of Atlanta is especially skilled at marketing identity and sense of place as you might recognize the names from this list of in-town neighborhoods. As I read neighborhood names that you recognize, make note of the mental image that comes to your mind and your impression of its related neighborhood characteristics. Um, some of the popular ones are Buckhead, Candler Park, Druid Hills, Inman Park, Midtown. Each neighborhood paints a different mental image and has a unique set of characteristics. I'd like to demonstrate 
identity, and sense of place with a picture. Uh, let's see. Okay, so who can tell me where that house is? Anybody? Anyone guess? Okay. Well, look at the butterfly. Okay, it's in Inman Park. And, and how do we, what other places do we see that butterfly? Here it is on the street signs. Okay, and this is what we're trying to do in the Riverline Historic Area. This is our road sign with our logo. The Riverline Historic Area name and logo was produced by the graphics department of Wheeland Homes to market our historic area community. It can be seen in the newer subdivisions in the historic area, like this one at Riverline Hill. This is their entrance sign. Um, but ironically, you won't find it at Wheeland Homes. Oh, well, Pulte Homes. Providence subdivision, which is rich with historic resources. Why not? Because their business is building on the land, not preserving it. Our historic, historic area needs help from our board of commissioners to balance the scales of development by preserving you, Cook. six acres of historic resources in a 145-acre Pulte Providence subdivision, OB40. Viewers can help by signing the neighborhood petition at riverline.org homepage. Thank you. The next speaker is Hale Sanders. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Cobb County Commission. <clears throat> I'm Hale Sanders, and I'm speaking as a board member, officer, and treasurer of Family Promise of Cobb County, a nonprofit program dedicated to helping homeless families to find affordable housing in Cobb. And I'm speaking about the potential grant next year from Cobb, County, uh, Cobb Collaborative Foundation. And I'm in Bob Ott's district. According to our two school systems, Atlanta and Marietta, uh, I'm sorry, Marietta and Cobb County, there are over 2,000 homeless school children living in our county. For the most part, uh, these families live in motels or their own cars, shelters, or double up with other families in apartments or houses. Even so, this doesn't make for a very stable environment for the children to stay in one school and learn well enough to graduate from high school. In a recent national survey, over 40% of formerly homeless youths surveyed said that they had dropped out of school or stopped attending school while they were homeless in middle or high school. Part of the reason for the number of homeless families in Cobb is that there is a very low rate of affordable housing here. We have been very fortunate to have, to have so many fine places to live in Cobb. Yet many people are working and trying to make ends meet, but can't afford the few homes that are available to them. An article in Politico.com about four years ago said that Cobb County had the lowest rate of affordable housing available in the country. A separate article indicated that the rate was less than 2%. Our program, Family Promise of Cobb County, has been in business for nearly four years helping to place homeless families into affordable housing. And so the families stay at our various churches. We have over 22 congregations, uh, and they stay at each congregation for one week at a time until we can place them into housing. Uh, we usually average about 13 weeks, well, 11 to 13 weeks to get them into housing. And during that time, as I say, they stay with our various congregations. If we encounter some difficulty finding housing, they may have to stay up to 16 weeks in our program. Our new effort to help this is renting transitional homes, usually from other churches that we can provide to our families for three to six months. So they can stay in the various churches for up to about 12 to 13 weeks or more, and then move them into transitional housing for a few months. And they work with our case manager 
to make sure that they can pay their bills and be economically viable in our community. And we provide training to them uh, and work with them individually to make sure that they are economically viable. The grant in question that I mentioned earlier represents about 10% of our annual budget. And with that grant, we can afford to hire either a part-time aftercase, aftercare case manager, which is the aftercare program I just talked about. After they leave our congregations, we still want to stay in touch with them, but we don't have an aftercare case manager yet. Or we can obtain more transitional homes, which will help enable us to serve more families. Without that grant, we will have to hold back on expanding into additional transitional homes and thus not be able to continue to expand and reach out to other families who we want to serve. We know after Katrina that some families moved into Georgia and into Cobb County. Now with the recent hurricanes in Houston and Puerto Rico, it's probably likely that some of them may move here as well. So the homeless rate could go up in Cobb County. We in Family Promise want to be in a position to continue to help homeless families find affordable housing, and we ask that you support our request for the funds specified in that grant for next year. Thank you very much. And what was the name of your ministry again? Family Promise of Cobb County. Okay, thank you. We're 501c3. We've been in business for four plus years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I might give this to somebody. The next speaker is Bob Foster. Thank you, commissioners, for letting us speak this morning. I'm Bob Foster. I live in District 3 and have for since the mid-'80s. Um, I'm also with Family Promise of Cobb, and so rather than reading you everything that I wrote that didn't get coordinated with Hale's remarks in detail, I know you, you get duplicated stuff all the time. I'll try and cut to the chase some. Um, when, when Family Promise started, we were, we're one affiliate out of a couple of hundred of these around the country that does this. And uh, some of our board members had not worked with a homeless ministry before. And so we've had to learn some of those statistics that Hale talked about, that every year, year in and year out, there's about 2,000 kids in Cobb County and, and Marietta schools that at some point during the year don't have a residence. And the school social workers tell us about this. The last number I heard was 2,200. Um, I don't know if that's going up or down. We haven't done this long enough. Uh, and then the other number that I, I mentioned last month when I also spoke was that uh, this county has the lowest availability of affordable housing of any county in the nation. Hale mentioned that. Um, in the suburbs, the chronically homeless um, that you see so much downtown in Atlanta uh, where I worked for years, are kind of invisible. And necessarily the families that we work with are even more invisible because the parents are keeping their kids off of the streets as much as they can, uh, so they can't sleep under a bridge or they can't often can't even use must because if you're a single mom and you've got a 12-year-old son, he's going to have to sleep in the men's dorm upstairs from you, and that doesn't work. So... Um, We've had to learn kind of the, the world of some of the people that we're trying to help. And, and typically, the people that we're helping are the low-hanging fruit. They're the people that have just become homeless, uh, are really motivated to be rehoused again. And so they're working really hard. They've got a job already, typically. They've got a car already, typically. They may be sleeping in it. Um, but they come to us and living in the, the churches and synagogues that we have in our network, uh, is a blessing for them because they don't have to pay rent, they don't have to buy food, they don't have to worry about a place each night. Um, they can focus strictly on going to their job and finding a place to live. Um, we typically graduate a family in about 75 days, which is a couple of weeks longer than the national average because Cobb has got so little affordable housing. Um, we have about 22 congregations that we work with right now. Uh, it's about 10,000 people. Uh, in those congregations. Uh, in the first three years, we have ha housed about 12,000 uh, people nights um, in those congregations. Um, but we get about 700 applications for service every year, and the number keeps going up. Um, I remember a few years ago, I believe it was 2014, I went to the Cobb Redevelopment Forum at KSU. 
and I heard a lot of speakers there. There were some commissioners there, I believe. I believe Mike Lee was there. Um, there were speakers from the enterprise zones and from the redevelopment for uh, redevelopment authorities and developers. And uh, I, I specifically remember Jeff Fuqua speaking to the group and talking about the wonderful plans that he has for Cobb. And as a Cobb resident myself, all of the things that they were bragging on are the reasons that I moved here and the reasons that I love to live in Cobb, even before the Braves came along. Um, but the one thing that I, having now this, this angle to, to work with Family Promise, that I didn't hear was where would somebody in the Fuqua organization live if they were a maid or a secretary? And the housing for people in that income category is not being planned as, as it seems to us in Cobb County. And the remainder that has been around for a while is dwindling and rents are going up. It's a landlord's market right now. So the people that we are trying to help um, and the people that must help in all of the categories that you deal with um, are finding it harder and harder to re-enter society. And the nonprofit grant really helps make that possible. I believe it's an investment that the county has made. Um, I know that you've indicated that you'll, we'll have another opportunity to talk about this, so I'll stop now. But thank you for continuing to think about this and keeping an open mind. Okay, thank you for all the speakers. Uh. Is anyone here, before we get into the, the, continue the, is anyone here that's here to speak at the, uh, at the alcohol hearing later this in, in this meeting. Where, okay, so what what we need you to do is you're gonna be, you're gonna have to be sworn, okay? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna put you on that list of second speakers, and we're gonna swear you before you get your chance during the during the hearing. You want them to speak during the hearing, right? I want them to speak during the hearing and not to sign up for the. Okay, all right, list. so. So rather than speak during the hearing, we want you to stay and then we'll swear you in during the hearing, okay? So up, look, if you still want to do your five minutes, we're going to give you that, all right? But it's but I just want you to know that our plan is just to connect you to the hearing itself, all right? Okay, are we good? All right. Now tab two uh, is a consent agenda. Uh, just a couple admin notes. I'm sorry, um, the process that was shared wasn't what was discussed yesterday, and, and typically when we've had alcohol hearings, if persons desire to speak, they would do so during public comment, not during an actual hearing. So um, this is just new to some of us up here. We, this is, uh, the, the county attorney said that for the hearing, they have to be sworn. Typically is not public involvement in the hearing. Okay. But, but I think part of the reason is, is normally we don't have people that have filed formal letters of opposition and so part of the well okay but that's that's part of the reason why we're having the hearing at all because and, of the and so part of the hearing would be the opportunity for both parties to question one another right so yeah, the thought process yesterday was to get them connected to the hearing but to, and early, if, but since there's going to be some people speaking on both sides of the issue they have to be sworn so they can still come and speak before the hearing if they want to okay Yes, I, but they're also going to be they get, give the opportunity to to, uh, to make their comments during the hearing without to be sworn for those. Okay. No, it, that makes sense. It's just a significant shift in our hearing process that wasn't discussed with commissioners. I I understand. It, it somehow didn't come up yesterday during the agenda prep. I'm not sure why. Um, but the bottom. But what we're going to do now is just for clarity. There's still six spots for the second public hearing. There before the hearing itself, okay. and if you want to talk during that time, you're going to be provided the opportunity to do that. If you, but during the hearing itself, the process allows for sworn uh, testimony, pro and con. Correct. Yes, uh, I would say, however, what what is presented during public comment is right. not sworn testimony. That's correct. That's and correct. Technically, it's not part of the hearing. That's correct. 
but some people might not want to be sworn in. They just want to make their comments before the before the hearing itself. So that we're given the opportunity to do that. So, but in this case here, both the people indicate they want to be here during the hearing to be sworn. So we just want to take them off the six slots uh, that are available for the second public hearing. And I don't believe anyone has signed up for those six okay. slots. All right. Now your concern is that the process has changed from what you used to before and that during previous hearings, people were not sworn in during the hearing to give. Yes, Chairman, this is a significant shift in what we've done in the past, and it is not, um, even though I can understand it, it would have been much better received had this been discussed with commissioners, especially when it was brought up during um, our agenda prep yesterday. Okay. So did we know that there are going to be people that are going to be asking to speak and be sworn yesterday? I guess that's my question. Do we know there are going to be people come to the hearing who are going to be sworn in to give testimony? I'm not certain. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. It's my understanding from our discussion yesterday that because we have never allowed speakers during the actual hearing that we were going to move the public comment portion up ahead of the hearing for them to give um, comments at that time. So I was not aware to you just explain the reason for putting it in the hearing because of the sworn testimony and it be allowed. So I, I'm okay with that now, now that I know the reason and the legality, but it, it wasn't explained to us that way yesterday, and I think that's what you and I are referring to, correct? Right. If the board would like, council will explain the, the yeah, process. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to clarify, because I know there was a question from some of the board members, the only reason that we are here today at all is because this is a deferred hearing. There were no other disqualifying elements to this application. So those folks that filed a timely written objection to the application are the basis for us being here. By the, by the code, by the Cobb Alcohol Code, once the Business License Division receives written objection, they have to defer consideration of the application and put it before the License Review Board, which they did. And those folks spoke at that hearing. They have to because that's the only basis for even considering this application at this level. So it's a little bit different than the other situations where people wanted to speak, but there were other problems like a distance violation that might have served as the basis for denying the application. So we have to have these folks on the record speaking during the case in chief because they're the only reason we're having this hearing at all. Where were you yesterday? <laughs> Sorry, I was absent. <laughs> Better right, late so, than never, Mr. Chairman. But that, that brings a lot of clarity to it, okay? okay. So, We've never done so this is... This is an unusual circumstance. It is. It's probably the first time in my tenure that we've done it this way. Okay. So, yeah. so are we all on board where we are now, why we're doing it this way? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and I don't you. want you to be missing again, all right? This is, oh. I'm just kidding. All, all is good. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the explanation. Appreciate yes, that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, tab two, um, we're, we're withdrawing uh, item 28 from the agenda. But we're also adding, so why don't you show item 28, please, on the screen. Okay, oh, too far. Uh, oops, in the other direction. I'm sorry? Oh, so it's, all, so it's not even on the sheet here. Okay, so we're drawing item 28, and... We also, the item about, and we're going to add 34 and 35. I'm sorry? That's correct. But I just I want, I want to let people know what they are before we vote on it, okay? All right, so. Right. Now, on 34, what I'm going to do is, um, because a little bit, some of them are a little complicated. Um, I would like for commission uh, for for the county clerk to read what 34 is about. Okay, 
And is that already added on the agenda sheet here? On the list of on the list of consentage items? There you go, okay. Um, Commissioner Ott, this is in your area, right? That is correct. Could you just give us a brief summary of what this is all about? Um, basically, this is a, a case that came um, between the county and the subdivisions that are mentioned about four years ago, Deborah. I think it was four or five years ago. And basically, um, the settlement has already been accomplished. And so basically, this is just simply a recording of the easement that was part of the settlement. And so, the, as you can see, it, it authorizes the chairman to sign the First Amendment to the reserved easement, which is basically changing the easement to reflect what was agreed to in the settlement. Okay, great. Um, so there's no money involved. This is simply just um, accepting the easement as was negotiated during the um, mediation. Okay. Commissioner Garrell? Yes. And we're moving that from tab 7 to consent, correct? Yes. Yes, that's separate correct. Separate item. That's the, correct. Okay. Right. So that should be pointed. So yeah, let's do that. Let's make it clear. So go ahead and make a motion to move it. Um, okay, I make a motion to move um, tab number seven, item number one, to the consent item as um, item number thirty-four. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call a question. It passes five to zero. Okay. Now, if the county clerk would read number thirty-five, just give us a summary of what that's all about. This is to authorize settlement of a workers' compensation claim on behalf of Michael Kreider, and the recommendation is for the Board of Commissioners to authorize settlement of the workers' compensation claim for Michael Kreider pursuant to the direction and with the terms discussed in executive session on October 9, 2017, and further authorize the Human Resources Director and the Workers' Compensation Administrator to execute the necessary settlement documents. Do we have a motion to, to add that to the consent agenda? I'd like to make a motion that we add as read into the consent agenda. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call a question. Okay, so that's, those are both added. Um, and we'd agreed yesterday to go ahead and pull item 28 from the consent agenda, just 28. Okay. Okay. All right, so that, that cleans that up. Now, with that, uh, I move to, to approve the consent agenda as revised and authorize the execution of the necessary documents by the appropriate county personnel. Second. We have a second. Any okay. discussion? Call the question. It passes five to zero. Thank you very much. I appreciate you working with me on that. Okay, tab three. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. County Manager. We have eight items this morning. The first item is to approve work authorization number two to the consolidated contract with Atkins North America, Inc. for program management services for the 2005, 2011, and 2016 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Programs. Work authorization two in an amount not to exceed $19,954,000 is requested for continued program management services for the 2005, 2011, and 2016 SPLOS TIPS to include program management assistance, pre-construction service, right-of-way services, and complete construction management services. Work authorization two is requested for the two-year period beginning January 1st, 2018 and continuing through December 31st, 2019. We request the Board of Commissioners approve work authorization two to the consolidated contract with Atkins North America, Inc. in an amount not to exceed $19,954,000 for the program management services to include program management assistance, pre-construction services, right-of-way services, and complete construction management services for the 2005, 2011, and 2016 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Programs for the period, two-year period of January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2019. Mr. Rott. Motion to approve as presented. Second. For a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to zero. Thank you, sir. Item number two is to approve change order number one final to the contract with CMES for construction of Six Flags Drive, renamed Riverside Parkway. Six Flags Drive is an approved project in the roadway safety and operational improvements component of the 2011 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program. Construction of the project is complete and change order number one final to the contract with CMES, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $229,943.18 is requested due to variations between the original and final plan quantities. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with CMES, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $229,943.18 for construction of Six Flags Drive, renamed Riverside Parkway. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. 
Second. Second. A discussion? Call a question. Passes five to zero. Thank you, sir. Item number three is to approve change order number one final to the contract with Construction Engineering and Management Company, LLC, for Castile Road Sidewalk. Castile Road Sidewalk is an approved project in the sidewalk component of the 2011 Splash Transportation Improvement Program. Construction of this project is complete in change order number one final to the contract with Construction Engineering and Management Company, LLC, a savings to the project in the amount of $77,988.68 is requested due to variations between the original and final plan quantities. The project savings will be retained in the sidewalk component of the 2011 Splash Tip Fund. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Construction Engineering and Management Company, LLC, a savings to the project in the amount of $77,988.68 for Castile Road Sidewalk. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. Uh, Director, I'd like to request, and I know we may have one coming up, as, uh, an update on what's left in 05, 11, and 16 on the sidewalk funds in each of our districts. If you Certainly, know. sir. And Because this goes back into those particular It goes pots. in 2011, yes. Correct. So we'll do that. All right. Motion to approve as presented. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Pass the five to zero. Thank you, sir. Item number four is to approve change order number one final to the resurfacing contract 2015-2 Local Road South with Baldwin Paving Company, Inc. for resurfacing of county-maintained streets. Resurfacing is an approved component in the 2011 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program. Resurfacing is complete and change order number one final to the contract with Baldwin, a savings to the project in the amount of $353,701.39 is requested due to variations between the original and final plan quantities. The project savings will be retained in the resurfacing component of the 2011 SPLOS TIP Fund. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the resurfacing contract 2015-2 Local Road South with Baldwin Paving Company, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $353,701.39 for resurfacing of county-maintained streets. Commissioner Cupid. Someone. Second. Have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to zero. Thank you, sir. Item number five is to approve change order number one final to the contract with Chatfield Con Contracting, Inc. for drainage system repairs on Spring Hill Parkway. Drainage system improvements is an approved component in the 2016 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program. Construction of the project is complete and change order number one final to the contract with Chatfield Contracting, Inc. A savings to the project in the amount of $6,750 is requested due to variations between the original and final plan quantities. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Chatfield Contracting Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $6,750 for drainage system repairs on Spring Hill Parkway. Commissioner Ott. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to zero. Thank you, sir. Item number six is to approve change order number one final to the contract with DNH Construction Company, Inc. for drainage system improvements on Maybreeze Road at Shallowford Road. Drainage system improvements is an approved component in the 2016 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program. Construction of the project is complete and change order number one final to the contract with DNH Construction Company, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $65,918.56 is requested due to variation between the original and final plan quantities. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with DNH Construction Company, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $65,918.56 for drainage system repairs on Maybreeze Road at Shallowford Road. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you, Jim. Uh, nice to see a savings, and mm -hmm. especially in a school area and much needed project. Uh, motion to approve. We have a second. Any questions? Call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Thank you, sir. Item number seven is to approve change order number one final to the contract with C.W. Matthews Contracting Company, Inc. for construction of skip span connector. Skip span connector is an approved thoroughfare improvements project in the 2011 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program and is also an approved project in the Atlanta Regional Commission Plan 2040 Regional Transportation Plan designated as State PI number 0010157 and ARC project number CO-400. 
Construction of the project is complete and change order number three final to the contract with C.W. Matthews Contracting, uh, Contracting Company, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $108,376.14 is requested due to variations between the original and final plan quantities. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number three final to the contract with C.W. Matthews Contracting, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $108,376.14 for construction of skip span connector. Commissioner Burrell. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, nice to see a savings on such a major project um, with the help of our partners, Town Center CID, the state, GDOT, and also KSU in this. Thank you. Motion to approve. Sure. Uh, we have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. It passes five to zero. Thank you, sir. Our final item is to approve a utility relocation agreement with Georgia Power Company for preliminary engineering and relocation of facilities on Bells Ferry Road. Bells Ferry Road is an approved project in the roadway safety and operational improvements component of the 2005 Splice Transportation Improvement Program. Construction of this project will require Georgia Power Company to remove and relocate their existing facilities. Since the facilities may be located on Georgia Power Company's easement, the cost for the relocation in the amount not to exceed $201,181 may be reimbursable by Cobb County. We request the Board of Commissioners approve a re utility relocation agreement with Georgia Power Company in an amount not to exceed $201,181 for preliminary engineering and relocation of facilities on Bells Ferry Road. Uh, Commissioner Burrell. Motion to approve. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to zero. Thank you, sir. We're going to take a short break since this next uh, item may have some discussion that takes some while. So take about a 10 minute break. Okay. By way of background, the East Marietta Library is an 8,600 square foot two story facility built in 1967 and is one of the county's oldest library facilities. It's located at 2051 Lower Roswell Road in Marietta. In 2014, the board approved the construction of the new Library and Culture Center to replace the existing facility as part of the SPLOS program. The impetus for such a visionary venture is part of a growing national trend to blend services and programs as an efficient use of space offering joint programming via a campus type or complex type approach. Operating costs and the need for specialized staff for this 30,000 square foot unique facility were articulated and provided during the July 2014 SPLOS discussions. This past June, the Board of Commissioners approved the renaming of the library to the Sewell Mill Library and Cultural Center a joint use facility in collaboration with our Parks Department. This facility, slated to be open this December, early December, requires additional library and cultural arts staff to operate. Staffing includes one full-time and five part-time employees for the library, in addition to two full-time and two part-time staff for the cultural arts program. Some of the specialized programming includes creative spaces, recording studio, an art gallery, visual performing arts, a black box theater, and an outdoor amphitheater. The East Cobb Government Services Center facility is not closing. The primary functions provided by the business office of the East Cobb Government Services Center include property tax payments, exemptions, or exemption requests, vehicle tag renewals, acceptance of water payments, and assistance with business license renewals. The satellite office of the tax commissioner office remains, as does the police precinct, the fire station, and the community room. Assistance with water payments and business licenses will be handled by the respective departments at their main locations, online or by mail. Partial funding is requested in the following proposal. The restructure of the services provided within the East Cobb Government Services Center business office operations in the amount of approximately $95,000.
The remainder of the funding is requested from the use of economic contingency funding. Funding for the library is approximately 94,000. Funding for the cultural arts programming and operating is approximately 284 to 27. The recommendation from staff is that the Board of Commissioners appropriate the remainder of FY18 for operations of the new Sawmill Library and Cultural Arts Center in the amount of $283,887. Authorize the creation of the positions mentioned earlier, effective December 4th, 2017. Authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Okay, Commissioner Rod. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to commend Jackie and her staff for the last two months. Um, you all did a yeoman's job of, of trying to meet the challenge that the chairman uh, gave us, which was basically to figure out how to make it work with the least amount of impact to the budget. Um, and as my fellow commissioners know, your staff sat down with me and you and, and we worked through um, trying to come up with a way to have the least impact on the budget. And, and it was my belief that the way that should happen is only to impact um, things in District 2. And so um, that is where the East Cobb Government Center came into the discussion. Just kind of a little bit of um, note about the um, government centers. They were created in the 80s. When, when the county was a lot less dense um, and the two main parts of the county were East Cobb and South Cobb, South Cobb being the, the original um, area and then East Cobb. And so the thought back then was to help the community um, by putting satellite government offices in East Cobb and South Cobb. That was back in the 80s. Times have changed and with uh, technology and electronics and a lot of other things and the, with the size of the county, um, a lot of those operations, as you've mentioned, can be done in other places. Um, there's a tag office in the government center. Then, and as you mentioned, this is more of a restructuring than it is a closing. Um, the fire station, the police station, the community rooms, and the tag office are still going to remain. Um, and some other things that came up in our discussion was looking at kiosks. Um, and originally, we had looked at putting kiosks in these locations, but then determined that because there was benefit to kiosks um, potentially around the entire county, it made more sense to um, take the time to look at, you know, the, the different vendors and all that and the services that could be provided um, instead of just looking at this one location, um, potentially looking at the kiosk um, for a more broader use around the county, which as a result would actually make things a lot easier. You know, right now you can go pay your Comcast bill um, at a kiosk and there's a lot of other places that you don't, you know, you can do everything electronically if you don't want to do it um, online. Another important factor to point out here is that um, a portion of the money that went towards the construction of this library is $2 million that came from the state. Um, this library um, predates me on this board. It was uh, initially started by Commissioner Thompson, working with uh, Representative Sharon Cooper um, in getting this library to work up the list with the state to get the $2 million. And part of what was presented to the state each year was the fact that it was going to be a library and a cultural uh, center. And so to open portion of it without opening the other portion would basically be putting a black eye on the county with the state. And I know that the, the county has got other libraries that um, we are trying to get money from the state to um, help improve those or um, expand those. So I'm gonna make a motion to um, approve item number one as presented. Um, okay. That'd be my motion. We have a second. We have a second. Second. All right. And discussion. So I'll start with Commissioner Burrell. Thank you, sir. Um, I do understand the this being on the SPLOS list and the state money for the library portion, um, and that we can't build things like this and have them sit empty. I do understand that. Um, my concern is the timing. Um, we, when we did not raise the millage in July, we agreed to look at how we were gonna fill the $21 million hole that we're in. And I can't, until we have our retreat at the end of the month, 
and look at everything, all of our options of sustaining that one-time money of $21 million. I can't see adding new positions and new um, facilities. Um, I think it would be best if we hold this until then, we can have the um, old library, the East Marietta Library contents moved over to the new space once it's completed, and we can have the contractor demo the, the old building for the parking lot um, and until we transfer, it's not a savings, but transfer the positions from the government center to the, the new library, January 1, I think we can look at funding, the staffing the whole thing at that time. But I, I can't support this at this time. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, the library that's currently there will be transferring over and closing, correct? Yes. Uh, the one that was built in 1967, yes. Okay. And uh, I like the idea that Commissioner Ott recommended the kiosk because apparently, you know, there are only two government centers in uh, uh, certainly West Cobb and Northeast Cobb have grown quite a bit and those would function quite well in uh, locations with little impact on cost or whatever. So I think it's a great idea that we do that. And I believe when we had our discussion yesterday, we talked about the volume of non tax commissioner business and it was pretty light that was being provided there at certainly in this government center. Uh, so I think the idea of is very creative and I completely support what Commissioner Hodge is trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Cupid. I concur with um, Commissioner Burrell's, um, excuse me, Commissioner, Commissioner Burrell's comments with respect to this not being the right time to make this decision. This item has been held already. Um, it came before the Board of Commissioners to come on the agenda and it was pulled because of the same concerns that were shared um, by Commissioner Burrell and, and some of them which I'll share today. But the thought was to make sure that there was conversation with all commissioners prior to this coming back on the agenda item, on the agenda. That didn't happen though. So um, there's some concern about that. There is not um, a save in positions as was shared by Commissioner Burrell, but a shifting of money to make this happen. And that would be okay in ordinary circumstances, but our um, circumstances are not ordinary. After our millage vote in which we decided not to pass um, a millage that was commensurate to the amount of need or burden on this county. And then we passed a budget acknowledging there would be no shift or no increase in services from this prior year. That impacted a lot of people throughout the county and it impacted a lot of agencies, it impacted operations. So it is very difficult when um, we made that decision to not make increases to all of a sudden come back with an agenda item to increase um, the amount of um, employees needed for um, the library. Um, Commissioner Brawl stated that we have a retreat at the end of this month. This is when we, when we were supposed to consider any additional burden on the budget. Um, why this cannot wait an additional 20 days is um, beyond me. Um, but I understand that um, you know time is of the essence with getting things done. But again, we lost some of that privilege to, to be as mindful of time when we chose not to pass the millage. There's some burden or consequence that we all have to bear. And um, it's unfortunate that those who made decisions to cut the millage are now benefiting from an increase of positions. It, to me, it sends the wrong message to the county, sends the wrong message to departments, sends the wrong message to commissioners that we're not taking responsibility for our actions, that if we are going to cut money for services, then we are going to have to bear the responsibility of that decision. To me, this is another shift of kicking the can down the road. 
The money that will be used for these positions is one-time money. These positions that will be added for this library are sustainable positions. So where is that money going to come from? This is just, to me, moving uh, um, the conversation of having a, um, adequate millage for this county. Um, it is just um, making that discussion more challenging, and it's also going to make the cost higher because we're going to have to increase our millage for it. Um, I think we should move forward in opening the library, but this is not the only option that also was on the table. There has been a practice that this county has had in moving towards regional libraries. There have already been two districts that have been impacted by cutting libraries to support regional libraries. It's happened in South Cobb, and it's also happened in District 1. However, it's not happening here. Um, even though we've been um, engaged in that process for several years now, why we are not doing it again during this time when the board has made the millage decision that it has is a little bit beyond me. Um, I think the prudent thing to do here is to see how this could be facilitated um, without having to spend any time one um, spend any one time monies, or at least to wait until October 30th, where we can consider all of the outstanding requests of the county as a whole. Um, just this last Board of Commissioners meeting, we had several requests from nonprofits even today about the services that they're losing. One time money could have been available for that, but we chose not to use it for that purpose. There are other outstanding requests, all of them which I will not go into, including over 5,000 DOT requests. We could have used um, one time money to perhaps hire a contractor to address those things, but we haven't done it. We have body cameras, which have not been purchased for all of our police officers. We could have done that with one time money. That's a capital um, investment. That's not being done. We have trash on our right of ways, which continues to come up. We could have considered increasing contracts to address those things, but that couldn't have, that couldn't be done. We heard from different agencies that came before this board that talked about significant impacts to their departments um, that would affect their operations. One which um, specifically comes to mind is listening to fleet and talking about the renewal of licenses, which they needed money for to be able to keep vehicles running. Um, we didn't have funding for that. We listened to, um, to we listened to support services talk about the degradation of buildings, which could be invested in with one-time money, and that's not being done. There's a there's a laundry list of requests from not just within the department, but from constituents, and also from um, constitutional officers. So this decision today, even though it's just an impact of um, a little under three hundred thousand dollars, doesn't sit well in light of all of those outstanding requests and in light of the um, decisions that um, we've made to, to, cut, um, to cut millage and funding to this county, we have to be responsible for, the, for those. And I just don't see how this decision today helps us to get there. Hey, thank you, Commissioner Cupid. Um, just a couple brief remarks on my part. You know, this is a big juggernaut that was coming down the road in the form of a $10 million building that's been traveling at a slow rate of speed, but nonetheless, it was coming. And now uh, it's here. And uh, there are two things that, that drove my actions, three things actually. Um, one of them was that there are contractual obligations that are connected to this library. Like, for instance, if we have a contractual obligation to be prepared to close the building so they can start preparing the parking lot, and if you don't meet those obligations, then there's penalties involved that the, the county will incur. All right, they may not be large, but nonetheless, we're fighting for every dollar in our current budget. Uh, second of all, I completely agree with Commissioner Cupid that it, uh, that um, this is an amount that should be funded with uh, sustainment dollars in the budget. The trouble is, is that in July, the board took that tool away from me because they vote they didn't vote for the millage rate that I proposed. So what I'm left to deal with to deal with this juggernaut is what's out there, which is uh, which is one-time money. Um, I would I wish it was otherwise, but I don't deal with otherwise. I deal with reality. And the reality is, we have a ten million dollar investment that this board has known about for years, and it's dropped in my lap to fix. So it's not it's not a pretty fix. I understand everybody's point of view, 
But my point, but my, but what I'm driven by here is that we have to open up this library because we have obligations, both formal and informal, to the state and to the people of this county to open up this facility because they've been expecting it. Um, I was the one that asked Commissioner uh, uh, Commissioner Ott originally had a, a library on the list to use as a bill payer, and I was driven by two things, uh, actually by three things, and why I asked him to take that library off the list and not use as a bill payer for that. First of all. Libraries are a reflection of the culture of our society. And it's not that I'm opposed to, consolid to consolidating our libraries. We need to do that, and we're going to bring that back to the table. I'm not sure why we didn't do that plan, but we're going to really look at that. But the libraries reflect the culture of our society, and more importantly, they're not just for books, but they're also access for people trying to get into the workforce. The libraries today are used for much, much different reasons than they were when I was in 1967 when I was in high school. So I've always been a big proponent of libraries, but I'm also well aware of the fact that this is county money, and Commissioner Ott has done an incredible job here along with Dr. McMorris, because the original amount that was going to be proposed a month ago was around $700,000, isn't that correct? And yet they've bared, they bared this down to under $300,000. So it's, they've taken a, we, we're going to open up this facility, but it's going to be on a shoestring, all right? But we're going to open it because we have, the, uh, we have the contractual obligation to do so. And the fact that we didn't decide to, to deal with the o and the operations and maintenance issue of this board until now, is something that I can't explain in the past, but I can explain the future. And the future is this library is going to be opened because the people have asked for it. And uh, if we're going to close libraries, we're not going to do it in, 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 you know, in, the, in the picture, in the, in, the, uh, in the press or anywhere else. I want to commend John Gargas on your really excellent article. Uh, I believe it was the other day on this, this, this issue about, maybe it was this morning, about the issues of only libraries. And if you haven't had a chance to do that, I'd commend that to you. Because it states exactly what, this, what the status is of these libraries. We have 19 libraries. We have a consolidation plan. And we need to be looking at it. And I can assure you that the retreat's going to be doing just that, using that as one of the things we're looking at here. But the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, is this the first of many battles that we're going to have because of the 6.76 millage rate that I'm going to have to build a budget to uh, starting in the end of October. And we already know we have a big hole there. Uh, the nonprofits are going to be given the opportunity to come back here uh, at the end of October because I, I understand uh, completely that they provide services to this county that they're essential. But you know, I'm the one that's supposed to work the budget and present it to the board. So I had to make the calls and what was going to come out. But I thought in this process here, I've, I've created somewhat of a back door to let people back in. But the bottom line is we're going to have to use one-time money to do that for right now, all right, or not, because that's the only tool left to me to provide services or to fund programs that have had a legacy here and that, uh, in fact, benefit the county. So... Um, Let's just frame this discussion today that if we stick at 6.76 for our, for our millage rate uh, to build a budget in 2019, uh, this will be the start of many long board meetings where we try to find, you know, how we're going to do this, but without one-time money because we're going to drain all those buckets this time. So uh, I, I reluctantly am going uh, to support this because I agree with the fact that I don't like to use one-time money. But the bottom line is I have to use the tools that are given to me, and right now the only way we can get this library open is to use one time money. So that, I'm sorry, Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. Just one final comment, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Uh, there's been a lot said about this is all because of uh, the millage vote, mm -hmm. when in fact what we did was not raise the millage by 0.13. Right. 0.13 in the great scheme of things is $4 million, mm -hmm. which is less than 1% of our budget. Mm -hmm. So blaming everything on that vote I think is erroneous, and I think that what we're doing and what I've wanted to do since I got here was take these three buckets of money that we have discovered that's been sitting there for decades and less of over $30 million and use it. What good is it if it just sits there? So we use it, and then we find out what we need to do to go forward. And I see no problem with using that money uh, if it's necessary at any time. And that's why we decided as a board to come back you know, everybody present to us right. whether or not to use that money, and there's still money remaining in that Correct. significant money. So, okay, thank Chairman, you. Thank may you for I that respond, point of view. please?
May I respond, please? Uh, I'm going to come back this way. Okay, Commissioner Burrell. Yes. Um, again, I understand using the one-time money for one-time things like capital that it doesn't have to be sustained, but if we keep adding to the 21 million one-time money that we're already in the hole for, for the 19 budget, we keep adding to it, we're gonna be digging a deeper hole in a deficit that we'll never overcome with one-time money. It's gotta be sustainable year after year after year. So I, I, I'm, like I, said, I still don't see why this can't be held until we can still meet our contractual obligations with the contractor, but we we have a retreat where all the departments are going to give us yeah. all the programs, services offered, and a cost associated with, so we can see how we're going to make up the hole that we're in and then some. But it was explained to us yesterday that we have contractual obligations to start as early as next week. So if we don't do this, we will incur penalties that we're going to add to this burden anyhow. So we're going to use one-time money to open this library or to pay for the, the penalties for not, uh, you know, complying with the contract. So well, my line I'm is, saying is can't we start the work, the contractual work, and and just open it January one instead of December fourth? What's 26 days. Well, the, the, the bottom line is, actually, we can still do the contractual work, but this board can bring it back to an agenda item anytime before December 4th, all right? We have the, we have the ability to do that. But what I, I don't see that all we're doing here is we're exposing a $10 million project, all right, to something where we've known about the issue and now we're just choosing, we're, we're having to deal with the issue because I'm forcing it this way. And I wish I could have done it sooner, but I can't. Uh, and that's just the way I feel about it. I mean, I, I wish it was otherwise, but it's not. Commissioner Cupid. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Chairman. We knew about the issue, but we also had planned for other ways of paying for this than using one-time money. That was never in the equation to use one-time money to support this. So when you talk about not wanting to talk about the millage vote, it has everything to do with this because our millage and our property taxes is what sustains ongoing expenses. As Commissioner Burrell shared, um, to sustain um, ongoing services, it is not only, it's prudent to have ongoing revenue to do that. There is no sure way that we know we're gonna have one-time money to sustain this year after year after year. In fact, in ACCG Budget 101, they say, and it's been echoed by this board, that you use, um, that you use ongoing revenue expenses I mean, on, ongoing revenue sources for ongoing expenses. You don't mix and match the two because you're going to end up in having the same problems that we're having today. There are many capital requests that have been made by the citizens of this county and um, by organizations and agencies of this county, which could have been addressed with that $30 million that Commissioner Weatherford wanted to share. And that would have been much more prudent. But to use those funds for things that we don't know we're going to be able to sustain year after year after year is not um, a prudent decision of this board. We are going to have to pay for it one way or another. And nobody has come up with what that funding source is going to be yet today. If that was on the table, this would be a much different conversation. But it's not. We are dealing with the reality that we have because of the millage vote that was uh, made by this board. I guess my question is, though, is that if... If we don't do this, then what we're going to do, because we're, the, the retreat at the end of October deals with the 2019 budget. So if we don't do this today, then in fact what we're doing is, because we're going to, if we don't vote it, vote for it, we're going, to, we're going to build a building, and then we're going to lock it up for a year, and then hope no. that during the next 10 months we decide to fund this. 20 days, I'm sorry, Chairman, that's rude. Sorry, Chairman. 20 days is not one year. But, but that's if we don't fund this now, or that's all I'm saying is even if we wait till the end of October, we're, we're going to have to, we're either going to fund this or we're not. So 20 days for something of this magnitude, you think it's going to make that much of a difference? Chairman, we have a lot of things of great magnitude of this county. We have a lot of things. I have yet to hear of any impact to this county for not making this decision today other than optics. 
And I feel as if we lost the convenience to be concerned about optics when we made the very difficult decision to vote on the millage the way that we did. And yeah. speaking of optics, how does it look for the other citizens that have been impacted by closing libraries due, the, due to the consolidation plan, which has been in the works for several years? You're telling me all of a sudden when it comes to East Cobb, they don't have to consolidate, but the other areas do, and we have to rush this now? To me, it's, it's wise to be fair, wait 20 days, as we already stated we were going to do, for any additional impact to the budget. Then we can consider this amongst the various requests. But just steamrolling this in without even having prior conversation with commissioners, to me, it does not send a very good message about us being all on the same page when it comes time to using one-time uh, money and to us waiting for the retreat when there are several other requests to have been put on the table. We told the nonprofits, wait until the retreat, and then we come back two weeks later and have something else. At some point, we have to stick to our word. Okay. Hey, Mr. Chairman, you know, we're going back and forth here, and you know, Commissioner Cuban, my understanding is that you had issues with this a week and a half ago. You never came and talked to me. You never reached out to me and said you had a problem. So don't sit here and tell me that no one talked to you. You had issues. You didn't come and bring them up with me. You had no problem coming to me when you, when you had an issue about the flex bus. Commissioner, I, you haven't been here. I, I'm talking. Commissioner, I, I, I am talking. You haven't been here. It is my mic. Um. So don't sit here and make accusations about not coming out, and Commissioner is not coming to talk to you, you did not reach out to address your concerns. And the Chairman has made it very clear, when there are issues, talk to the District Commissioner. You did not do that. Until I am talking, mm -hmm. it is Continue. my mic. Secondly, this library, the reason it went from 700000 down to 284000 is because it is minimal staffing, all right, as the Chairman said. And also, initially, as the chairman said, the proposal that came forward was going to close a District 2 library. So don't sit here and talk about District 2 being treated differently. They were not. It was the chairman's request so that we could have a comprehensive discussion about all libraries, which Commissioner Weatherford and I have been doing. Okay. So don't sit here and make accusations that you don't know what you're talking about. And so the, the proposal that originally came forward was a zero net cost at the chairman's request so that the discussion about libraries could be had comprehensively, this is why it was brought forward. And so um, I, I strongly disagree with your comments because you are making accusations that are unfounded. Um, I'm, chairman, I'm going to defend my honor. Okay. <laughs> um, chairman, we, we, all, we all know what the plan was. <clears throat> And it was stated, Chairman, that the district commissioner will go speak to the district commissioner whose item this is will go speak to all of the commissioners before it comes back on the agenda. That is what was stated. If this was of controversy, I should not have to go find the commissioner to talk about an agenda item which is doing something very unique with one-time money when we all knew what the circumstances were. We all knew why it was pulled off the agenda not once but twice. You know, so I'm not saying I'm not open to having conversation about it, but again, the conversation we all knew was going to happen in October. I did not know this was coming forward until I got my agenda book. And that's when we could have had the discussion. Yes, Commissioner Ott is right. We did talk about other issues. I did not think this issue was on the table when I spoke to him of the other matter, or else I would have brought it up. The other conversation I had with the commissioner was not adversarial, and this certainly could have been brought up at that time. So, Commissioner, I'm sorry if you feel as if I have somehow blindsided you with this. You knew that, again, this was an issue that was for all of us. But as Commissioner Burrell and I have stated, the time for this conversation was to be at the end of this month, not during this Board of Commissioners meeting. Okay. I think we've aired out our, our issues, so let's call the vote. And it passes 3-2 to two with Commissioners Cupid and Burrell in opposition. Okay, you're going on to tab five. Thank you, Dr. McMorris. Good morning, Chair. And that is to, uh, the purpose of this item is to authorize the appropriation of fire funds fund balance to reserve FY17 capital project funds into FY18. 
Between December 13, 2016, June 27, 2017, the Board of Commissioners authorized Cobb County Fire and Emergency Services to proceed with a number of capital projects pursuant to the Cobb County Fire and Emergency Services five-year strategic plan. These projects included capital improvements and capital replacements uh, for equipment and facilities. Um, while all of these projects are either at some phase in process, some of them have actually been completed and we're awaiting final invoice. Uh, so we, uh, as Cobb County Fire Emergency Services, our recommendation is to ask the Board of Commissioners to authorize the appropriation of fire funds fund balance to reserve FY17 capital project funds into FY18 in the amount of $8,068,377. Uh, for Cobb Fire and Emergency Services capital projects, authorize corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Uh, Commissioner Weatherford. Excuse me, just clarification, what was the total, Chief? I thought it was 8-4, you said 8 -6. No, that was, you should have a pink copy of a revised did I mention I'm colorblind? I <laughs> revised list. The total is eight million sixty-eight thousand three seventy-seven. So you're correct, and I'm wrong, correct? Actually, I'm the one that caused the uh, pink sheet to be delivered, and I apologize for that confusion. Got it. Okay. Motion to approve as presented. Second. There was second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Thank, Thank you, Randy. Okay, number six, tab six. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Dana Johnson, Cub County Community Development. Um, I think we have pulled item number one. Correct. So we will not be considering that. Correct. Is that correct, sir? Correct. Okay, so getting on to item number two. Item number two deals with a intergovernmental agreement between the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority and the Cobb County Board of Commissioners as it relates to administrative support towards the authority for a period of five years. Um, as a brief bit of background, in 2011, the Georgia General Assembly created the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority. Uh, they are a quasi-governmental, quasi-state agency who are... Uh, tasked with trying to assist in revitalization and redevelopment in a particular area of South Cobb. In June of 2012, the Board of Commissioners approved the original intergovernmental agreement that provided for uh, staff support to the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority. We did a three-month extension to that this past June uh, in order to provide additional time for us to... Um, hammer out the rest of the details as it relates to uh, this revised uh, this revised intergovernmental agreement. Uh, so with that, sir, I would ask the board to consider adoption of a renewed intergovernmental agreement between the Cobb County Board of Commissioners and the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority to provide administrative assistance under revised terms for a period of five years and to authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Pass the five to zero. Item number three, sir, is another intergovernmental agreement between the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority and the Board of Commissioners as it relates to excess funds in the Six Flags Special Services District. Uh, as a bit of background, in 2014, the Board of Commissioners approved the crea creation of the Six Flags Special Services District that had a number of capital projects uh, that were to be implemented in the area, in a particular area of South Cobb within the taxing district itself. In October, I'm sorry, September of 2015, uh, the Board of Commissioners and the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority approved the $10 million redevelopment bond that was funded through the proceeds of the Six Flags Special Services District. Um, one of the projects that are being considered uh, for implementation right now that was identified in the bond uh, was some landscape improvements to the I-20 interchange. The bond funds can be used towards the implementation of the infrastructure being put in, but cannot be used towards the, the, ma the ongoing maintenance of the infrastructure that's installed. The state also requires if there's going to be any type of um, improvements done on state infrastructure, they, they require a, a maintenance agreement basically, in order to ensure that that is maintained for a period of time. Uh, as such, um, the cost for the installation includes six months' worth of maintenance. 
as part of the contract. We are asking the board uh, to enter into an intergovernmental agreement to add another year to that six months, so we'd have one year, six months maintenance uh, at a cost of $54,360 uh, that will allow the county uh, to pay for the maintenance with no impact to general fund budget since it's paid for through the Six Flags Special Services District. Uh, so we would ask for that and ask for the chairman, uh, the corresponding budget transactions and authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. Second. A second. And we have a comment? I, I just have one question. Um, can we extend it for a year if we can't use that money for maintenance? The, there is a difference between the money. We're using not the bond money in order to pay for the maintenance. We're using the special district funds itself. There's more money being generated by the district oh, okay. than is required to pay off the bonds. So that excess fund, which can still only be spent in that special services district because right. of the um, because of the way the law was structured um, and the constitutionality of it. Um, so th that's the pot of money that's being utilized for the maintenance. Okay. Thanks. Just one okay. clarification. Okay. Any further discussion? Call the question. Call the first. question. Sorry. Bass is five to zero. I was checking out Bass. You're looking for pink slips, I know. <laughs> The final agenda item, sir, deals with um, purpose-built student housing. I, before I did that, I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Dance and her staff at the county attorney's office. They're a great help in putting these IGAs, working with the commissioner uh, and community development to get that done. So thank you, Ms. Dance. Um, getting into the uh, last agenda item for community development today um, on, on this tab deals with um, staff asking the Board of Commissioners to consider Ex, um, suspension of acceptance of zoning applications for purpose-built student housing until July 31st of 2018. Uh, this will provide staff time to complete two necessary studies, a uh, apartment density study and the analysis on, on purpose-built student housing. Staff is making this request because uh, the impact that purpose-built student housing can have on the community is something that we need to evaluate. It's a different type of housing that is just starting to come into Cobb County. We've, we've seen it for the last five years. Uh, and as we, as we have previously done, we want to ensure that coordination with Kennesaw State University with their enrollment projections so we have a good understanding of what the market will be for purpose-built student housing so we don't put uh, the county uh, at risk of a, a use that may have um, um, consequences as it relates to community health and, and community building. Uh, so with that, I would ask the board uh, if they would please um, direct staff to suspend applications of rezoning applications for purpose-built student housing until July 31st, 2018, or until staff has completed an update to the two studies, the apartment density study and the analysis of purpose-built student housing. Commissioner Burrow. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Dana, and your staff and legal as well. Um, and also our, our partners, KSU and Town Center CID, who have offered assistance as well. So with that, I'd like to make a motion that we um, instate a moratorium until July of 31st, 2018 or sooner. We have a second. Any discussion? One. One, One co comment here. I believe it reads up to December 3rd. Uh, whatever. Uh, yes, sir. Not yeah, until. Or sooner. Or sooner. Oh, I didn't hear the word. I said July, 8, July 31st, Sorry. 2018, or sooner. Sorry. Missed and that if we need to go beyond that with right. respect to the study not being completed or whatever, it'll have to come back to the board for an extension approval. Are there any zoning requests right now in this area for this? Yes. This code? There is one particular zoning request that's already in the system. Okay. Uh, this deals with a piece of property that is adjacent to uh, the Kennesaw State uh, football stadium. But this doesn't affect them. It's, it's they have apply. they have met all the criteria, okay. so they should meet. They should have a full hearing. Okay. Since they they were in process prior to the issuance of the moratorium. Right. Okay. It does not impact any existing okay. zoning. That I call a question. Passes five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Dana. All right, and we've we've done we've already done the one item in tab seven, so on to tab eight. Uh oh, 
This must be serious. He's wearing a coat and tie. Good morning, <laughs> commissioners, <laughs> chairman. Uh, Colonel Jose, I apologize for them picking on you. Uh, Roland Craig with the Sheriff's Office. Have three SPOS items for you this morning regarding uh, continued renovations at the jail. The, the first being an air handler unit um, portion of the 97 uh, building, 20 years old now, it's come to the end of life expectancy. Got a quote from Johnson Control, who has a master agreement with the county. Additionally, uh, it'll be an expense of an uh, extended rental on a crane as the unit, the existing unit, is going to have to be dismantled and portion of the building removed to remove that unit and install the new unit. With that, I ask the Board of Commissioners to ratify the continued renovation efforts so that the ADC authorized Johnson Control Incorporated to replace the air handling unit in NOPOD. An amount not to exceed $355,317.90. Approve funding for any required contingency solutions to be procured through the purchasing department, an amount not to exceed $33,364.50. Authorize Sheriff's Office to negotiate terms and conditions of the contract in consultation with the County Attorney's Office. Authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. And Colonel, just to be clear, and uh, this comes from the 2016 SPLOS as approved project and will not impact our general fund. Correct? Yes, sir. Right. Motion to approve as presented. So, so we have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Second item is re uh, regarding the upgrade and update of the key watch system we use to uh, do a daily inventory and control the issue of keys to all the staff twice a day on the two different shifts uh, every day. The system is uh, software and computer driven, so it's uh, at right at seven years old now. It's just needing an upgrade to the hardware to expand capacity and to the software that op actually operates the system. With that, I ask the Board of Commissioners to ratify the continued renovation efforts of the Adult Detention Center and authorize the purchase of the Morse Watchman's Key Bank Key Watcher Key Inventory System upgrade for Morse Watchman's Incorporated, an amount not to exceed $93,863 as part of 2016 SPLOS. Authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the Chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Weatherford. Motion to approve is presented. Second. We have a second. The discussion. Call the question. Passes Thanks. five to zero. And the last is uh, uh, food preparation uh, tables in the kitchen. Stainless three stainless steel tables. They're about over thirteen feet long each. Uh, assembly line type thing, similar to a school uh, school lunchroom uh, uh, environment as to where the meals are passed down. To average population of 2,000 in the jail, they're processing about 6,000 meals a day on these tables. There are seven, one is seven years old, the others are older. With that, I ask the Board of Commissioners to ratify the continued renovation areas of the Adult Detention Center and authorize purchase of kitchen meal preparation line tables from Borson's Food Service Equipment Incorporated, an amount not to exceed $22,920. Authorize the budget, corresponding budget transactions, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Mr. Weatherford. Thank you, Colonel. Motion to approve is presented. Second. Thank you. And we have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Pass five to zero. You should wear that suit more often. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Colonel. All right. Um, so now we're going to do the public comment. We have no one for public comment. Is that correct? Okay, so now we're going to go into the hearing, and uh, with that, you have the uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning again, Commissioners, Mr. County Manager, Madam County Attorney. Uh, as you indicated, we are here today on uh, a hearing on an alcohol license application for. Casbah Corporation Limited doing business as Paprika, located at 4674 Sandy Plains Road, Roswell, Georgia, 30075. Nasib Rana is the proposed licensee. And for the benefit of the licensee, my name is Sam Hensley, Jr., and I represent the Cobb County Business License Division. 
Now, I apologize for the confusion that we had earlier, but again, I'll, I'll briefly walk us through how we got here and what the applicable code sections are that we need to be considering today in regard to this application. This case was, or this application was deferred by the Business License Division because although it met all other criteria and the proposed licensee met all other criteria in the Cobb Alcohol Code for being granted an alcohol license, there was timely written objection that was filed with the Business License Division in regard to this application. These were filed by certain neighbors uh, who live in close proximity to the proposed location. Under 6-96 of our code, Mr. Chairman, under initial consideration of an application, and I'll read this briefly so we know what we're working with here, where an application for a license under this chapter otherwise meets all the criteria set forth in this chapter and written objection is made to such application, such application shall be treated as follows. In order for written objection to be sufficient to authorize a hearing, it shall describe how and why the person filing the objection or the immediate surrounding neighborhood will be negatively impacted by the issuance of such license or permit and shall specifically state the reasons therefore. And I believe these written objections, copies have been uh, included in your agenda packet for your review. When this occurs under this same section, Mr. Chairman, upon the proper filing of any written objection as set forth in this section, the business license division manager shall defer such application without prejudice and then schedule the matter for a hearing before the license review board. So again, the folks that filed these timely written objections are part of the actual evidence in the case and therefore they uh, are to be allowed to speak during the case in chief so that their testimony can be considered as evidence. They will be under oath and they will be required to address the proper criteria that will pertain to this type of application. Uh, I should also note in that same section, Mr. Chairman, that if the person filing the objection does not attend the hearing, the License Review Board shall consider the application but may consider the fact that the person filing the objection is not present. I say that, <clears throat> pardon me, only because I don't know that all of the people who filed written objections are present, but uh, it, the Board is free to consider to whatever degree you choose the written uh, objections and also to take into consideration that maybe they didn't feel strongly about it enough to come and actually testify before the hearing. That's up to this board. So the Business License Division deferred this application to the License Review Board, which heard this matter on August 10th of this year. At that hearing, various members of the public who had filed timely written objections were heard, and the License Review Board at that time voted unanimously to deny the application. So we are now here on an appeal of that License Review Board denial. Uh, and just as a point of order, Mr. Chairman, as you may recall, this case was originally scheduled to be heard before this board, I believe, on September 12th, but inclement weather that day caused us to have to postpone it till today's date. Again, there are no other disqualifying criteria that have been uh, violated in regard to this application. There's no distance violation. There is no uh, disqualifying element to the uh, applicants, to the proposed licensee's background. So again, the only reason that we are having this hearing is because of the written objection by the neighbors. Because of that, the criteria, the only remaining criteria in the code that needs to be considered by this board and which should be addressed by any objector is found in 6-106 which is entitled Additional Standards for Issuance, Renewal, Transfer, or Denial of an Alcohol License. I don't know that you have copies of this. I know you've got codes uh, before you, but I've made copies of that particular section to distribute just in case you need to refer to these criteria. I'll briefly run through what I think are the ones that may be applicable to this situation. Again, this is up to the written objectors to address any or all of these as they so choose. But this section states that in addition to the standards stated elsewhere in this chapter, the following standards shall apply for the issuance, retention, renewal, transfer, or denial of, the, of licenses for the retail sale of alcoholic beverages. Number one, evidence that even though there is compliance with the minimum distance from schools and churches, the type and number of schools or number of churches in the vicinity causes underage persons to frequent the immediate area. 
And again, I don't know if these are going to be elements that are addressed or not by these objectors, but these are the, the elements that they can address that should be considered by this board. Number two, evidence that the location or the type of structure could create difficulty in police supervision. Number three, evidence that there are no licenses granted in the area or that the proposed area already is adequately supplied with such licenses. Number four, evidence that a license for the location would be detrimental to the property values in the area. Number five, evidence that the license in that location would be detrimental to traffic conditions or that there is a lack of sufficient parking which could result in parking on the streets or adjoining property. Number six, evidence that alcoholic beverages have been sold to an intoxicated or underage person at this location. Well, since this is an initial application, that probably doesn't apply. Number seven, evidence that the conducting of the business creates a disturbance, congregation of intoxicated person, congregation of underage persons, or consumption of alcoholic beverages on the premises by underage persons, or causes the police to answer excessive complaints or make extra surveillance of the premises. Again, that's probably speculative at this point since the um, establishment has not yet been opened. Uh, the rest of these requirements are, are not applicable to this particular application, but those are the criteria that could be relevant in regard to your decision today. Uh, Georgia law does require, Mr. Chairman, and constitutional law as well, that the local governing authority may not have unfettered discretion in these types of decisions. So there has to be uh, ascertainable standards in the code that you can hang your hat on in, in making your decision. So that is why I've gone over those criteria because those are really the only criteria that can be considered. It has to be something that the applicant can ascertain and hopefully comply with in order to receive what is a otherwise even a privileged license such as alcohol. That is found just for the record, Mr. Chairman, in a long line of Georgia cases, including Hornsby v. Allen out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. For the lawyers in the room, that's, I'll give the citation for that. It's 326 uh, Fed 2nd 605. What I propose, Mr. Chairman, is uh, the licensee is represented by counsel, and she may wish to make a brief opening statement. Then I will swear in all the witnesses, including those people who would be speaking, uh, who have uh, filed timely written objections. Uh, our plan is to limit those speakers to three minutes each. They will be under oath and they will be subject to cross-examination by the uh, applicant's attorney. Uh, again, I will swear in everyone all at once so we, we get through that portion of it. Once the applicant's attorney has made whatever brief presentation, initial presentation that she would like to, then I will present my witness. Once I have presented my witness, then we uh, propose that at that time we allow the public speakers to come forward so they can express whatever concerns they have and can be cross-examined by the licensee's applicant. And that is all I have at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Good afternoon, or good morning. I guess it's still morning. Um, I'm Lisa Morshower. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Berman Fink Van Horn. Um, I'm a former city of Atlanta city attorney, and I handled licensing when I was at the city for about 11 and a half years. So I'm very familiar with the way alcohol licensing works. I've done a lot of applications in Cobb County as well. And um, before I make my presentation, I just want to thank a few people who, who helped with this um, hearing this morning because I had to make an open records request once we were denied at the license review board and I it was a pretty significant request I got a lot of help from Alicia Webb Sandra Richardson Tara Rogers Angela Cunningham and Pam Mabry all of them worked really hard to help me get these documents together and I've been through hundreds of documents in the Cobb system 
And without those ladies' help, I wouldn't have been able to get it done. So I thank them for that. Um, my client, Nasi Brena, is um, the owner of, Kas of Kasbah Core Limited, doing business as Paprika. She has been going through the process to get this alcohol license for quite some time, almost two years, I believe. I did not start working with her until the latter part of that, but she filed an application and it got deferred. Um, and then she decided to change her model, her business plan, because she realized that the neighborhood was not happy with what was going to be going on at that restaurant. Although it was going to be a, a restaurant with a family style menu, she also had intended to have hookah at the restaurant. But that was not something that settled well with the neighborhood and she completely changed that plan around. And um, that is why we're here today so that you can hear what she is planning to do. Um, she had to also go through the other business permit application process in the zoning arena, and that application was, was approved. She has conditions that were placed on it, and I believe that um, Mr. Hensley has a copy of that application for the record, if I'm not mistaken. I'd like it to be part of the record if he doesn't. Um, in, in that, in that um, application and process, she had certain conditions that require that she not have a nightclub, which was not intended to be there in the first place, and that she have no outdoor music, speakers, or paging system, so she will not have any of that. Um, she was limited on the hours that she could be operating, and the hours are from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Sundays through Thursdays, and 11 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. This is um, consistent with the location that she's in because in that location there are some other alcohol license establishments, all of which were approved, all of which were too close to the neighborhood. Each one of those li licenses had to be brought before you or, or the license review board to get distance waivers, and they were all approved. And um, I have a chart that I've made that lists all those restaurants that are in that location. But there's El Hinete, there's a, there was a Walmart neighborhood, pack, uh, neighborhood market, it's not there anymore, it just closed. Um, there's the Movie Tavern, which has a pouring license, El Hinete has a pouring license, Chopsticks, Sushi has a pouring license, and Corner Pizza has a pouring license. All of them, each one of them, had to go to the license review board to get approval to waive the legal requirement that they meet to a to, um, home. And each one of them got approved. And I thought that there was some opposition. I had heard that there was opposition from the neighborhood in regard to some of those licenses, but I couldn't find any evidence of that when I went through the um, records that I obtained from the open records request I made. So I can't tell you that one way or another that they were uh, any that there was any opposition. But it's the exact same neighborhood that backs up to this location where my client will be. And but they're opposing my client's small restaurant. It's it's a um, very small restaurant, and I have a traffic study as well, which will show you that there's no impact on the traffic whatsoever, um, which this restaurant will have. Um, this is a very busy corridor. It's fronted by three streets. The neighborhood sits on Mabry. The access into and out of the neighborhood is on Mabry. The uh, main road is 92, Highway 92, which is the front of the, of the shopping center, and then Sandy Plains is on the other side. The neighborhood does not sit on Sandy Plains. It backs up to businesses that sit on Sandy Plains. But the neighborhood, and particularly if I understand who's going to speak today, the people who are speaking live in a cul-de-sac that backs up to a Firestone, which is next door to my client's business. And they also back up, the whole neighborhood backs up to the shopping center. So there are many homes that are right against the shopping center. So all of these other licenses have been approved in this shopping center, but my, my client is being singled out and targeted by this neighborhood for not getting a license. Um, I also have a list of all the license, well, not all, of the ones I could find through my research, but I think I probably missed some because I didn't look at every single document that I was given or had access to because there were just hundreds of them. Um, but there are many occasions where this board or the county, through the license review board, has 
granted a license even when there was community opposition. And um, you had a hearing for a, a place called Wania Food Mart, which is a package license, um, in 2010, where the License Review Board denied that application. They had their hearing, lots of opposition, tons of letters um, of opposition. The License Review Board denied it, but the BOC approved it on December 7th, 2010. Other ones that were approved by the License Review Board straight out, even with community opposition, were Marietta Pizza Company, um, it was a pouring license, Big Liquor and Wine, package license, Uncorked, a package license, Sugar Cane, a pouring license, Fanatic Sports Bar, another pouring license, a Walmart neighborhood market, um, was approved by the License Review Board. I was unable to find where they actually got a license or the BOC approved it, but the License Review Board approved that one. And a racetrack, which was a package license that was approved by the License Review Board and then the BOC approved it. So there's, and that's just a little sample of, of what I could see in the records that I was given. Um, I only went back, I think, to 2010. So there's pr probably more behind that that had been approved. But I also did a, uh, I tried to pull out some places that were too close to residences that that got distance waivers, um, where they had major issues going on with the property or the business itself, besides the fact that they were too close to residences. Um, are we, are, I may say this wrong, Aurelio's, Aurelio's is pizza on Johnson Ferry Road had many issues. They had issues with um, Section 6-117, and they had issues with distance to residences. It was a pouring license. They got approved by the board, the License Review Board and by y'all in 2011. Rockstar Sports Grill had issues with, with several sections, 6-93, 6-124, which is distances to residences, 6-130, and they were, it was a pouring license. They got approved by the License Review Board and approved by this board on October 25, 2011. Um, El, El Taco Azteca was a, had many, many issues, including distances to residents and a distance to a YMCA. Those were waived. The, um, that one actually was denied by the License Re Review Board, but it came on appeal to your board, and you approved it on March 12, 2013. That's a pouring license. Um, another place called Truly Cigars, which is a pouring license, um, had issues with uh, distances to residences and another section, one section 6130. Um, they came through twice on two different applications. The first time it was approved, by your board on March 12, 2013, and then they came through again, I don't know why, maybe a change of ownership or some reason, I couldn't tell, um, on June 10th, 2014. So they've been, they were approved twice, even though they had these issues and were too close to residences. Um, and then another one called Jordan Lounge and Hookah Bar um, on Canton Road, it had a lot of issues. It had issues with Section 686, 6 6-86, 6 6-87, 6-93, 6-117, and 6-125, which was a distance to a church. Um, it also had violations for having illegal storage of alcohol on premises before it got a license. And it was for a pouring license. The License Review Board approved that license, and y'all approved that decision on September 8, 2015. So I'm bringing that forward just to show you that other applications have been approved, even where there were distance issues to various things, mostly residential, um, where they had other issues involved and they were approved. And that's not the case with my client. My client doesn't even have a distance issue. We meet the requirements to the code. We meet all the legal requirements. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about were applications in East Cobb, because my license, my application for this case is in East Cobb, or my client's application. Asahi Japanese Steakhouse got a license, even though it's too close to Northampton subdivision, on July 10th, 2002. Um, Chepe's Mexican Grill got a pouring license, even though it's too close to a, a neighborhood in, in uh, East Cobb, on September 2nd, 2010. Seed Kitchen and Bar, who I actually represent, um, got a pouring license, and it's too close to the residence is behind, right behind it. There's a patio at Seed. Patio sits right next to the residential property. But Seed was approved, thank goodness, on February 22nd, 2011. 
Zeal is another one, um, right, backs right up to neighborhoods. The, their um, distances had to be waived. And they had other issues too. Section 6-91, 6-92 were also part of their case. They were approved by the License Review Board and approved by your board on July 9th, 2013. And the last one, the latest one that I could find was Loyal Q and Brew down at Loyal, I mean, down at Lower Roswell. Um, it is very close to the neighborhood that's just been built down that way. And um, it's also too close to a library. And it got a pouring license approval from the License Re Review Board and then approved by y'all on July 11th, 2017. Those didn't have community opposition, but they had all these other issues, and, or at least I couldn't tell if there was opposition from what I got. But um, they had a bunch of issues and that they got waived. They did not meet the legal requirements to get a license, and the, the county waived those requirements and gave them licenses. Um, and then there, one of the things that was brought up at the license review board by one of the people speaking was that there, there were already too many licenses at this location where my client's trying to go in. Well... I found tons of places where there are multiple licenses all around, licenses that have been issued, and here's a few examples of those. Um, Muss and Turner's on Cumberland Parkway, which was approved on March 22nd, 2005. Keegan's, which I live right near Keegan's, um, is in the Shallowford Falls subdivision, and there are multiple licenses in there, and I've actually done work for Keegan's. Um, they had a license approval on February 28th, 2012. They are very close to the neighborhood that sits right behind them, which is Chimney Lakes. Uh, Keegan's has a very big outdoor area, at, uh, enclosed but screened-in area, and I have been to events there, and I know that they stay open until 1 o'clock. You can have alcohol until 1 o'clock, and ch uh, Chimney Lakes is right there behind it. Keegan's had to get a waiver approval because they were too close to those homes there. Uh, Cafe Vena has a pouring license, and it also had issues too close to residences, but there, but there are multiple places nearby with licenses on June 26, 2012. And the last one I have is Hookline and Schooner in West Village Place has a pouring license, and they're close to a lot of places. Um, they had to get a waiver to the distance to a home to homes, and they got that on January 27, 2015 from your board. I have all of this in a pack of evidence that I'm not gonna hand to you because it's just too much. But I would like to put it into the record if I need to, at the end of the record. Um, and it, it documents everything I just said. It's from the records that I obtained. Um, you're going to hear the, from my client about how she changed her business plan, her background, what her experience is with licensing. And um, you're going to see her menu and I have a resume of her chef that I'd like to show you so that you can see that he is a wonderful chef. The License Review Board found that the opposition was not strong. Um, they thought the menu was very, uh, looked very appealing, and the chair even told me that he looked forward to coming into the restaurant once we got open. So he felt like it was going to be a good restaurant. I don't understand why they voted to deny it. I think they wanted to just put the task on this board because they didn't want to make that decision. But the evidence was not strong at the License Review Board. It was not supported by law or fact. It was inconsistent with previous decisions, which I just stated. Um, and our, my evidence today will show you that we meet all the distance requirements. We don't fall into the category of 6-106 because there are, there are um, no, there's no evidence to show that we're going to cause detriment to any of the homes there. There is already, whatever is already going on at that location is already going on because the shopping center is very active and very busy. And my client's location will not impact it whatsoever. It's a very small building, and I've got pictures to show you of that. Um, the property that my, that the uh, objectors are, com are complaining, or the fact that they're living too close to my client's property is from the result of them purchasing homes that back up to a shopping center. And... Um, Certainly, they understood that when they bought the homes. They probably weighed the, the disadvantages and the advantages of living there and knew that there would be traffic and parking and noise and deliveries because it's a shopping center. So I think that they would have had to look at that when they purchased their homes. Um, that, there's one more thing uh, that I wanted to let you know, and we'll show it to you at, during our evidence portion. But at the hearing at the License Review Board, and even prior to that, we had had a meeting with the neighborhood. We, we delayed our License Review Board hearing to meet with the neighborhood to address their concerns. 
we have now uh, gotten a revised landscape plan, which I just got yesterday, which adds some buffering to the back of the property so that this, there's a strip there and it will, and we can put in seven hollies that will be six to seven feet tall and that will give a very nice buffer to the back part of the parking lot. So I will show that to you when we, when we get to our evidence portion. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just to address a couple of things that Ms. Morshauer said, uh, she indicated she has a packet of information that she has kind of summarized in regard to other establishments that have been granted alcohol licenses. Uh, for the record, and I've already informed her of this, I do want to object to any of those that may not be based on the same criteria and the same code sections that we're dealing with today, because the criteria is different. The criteria for distance waivers is found in 6-124 and 6-125. There are different criteria than you would find uh, from what I read to you earlier under 6-106, uh, which are the additional standards that must be considered. So uh, I think what she's driving at is kind of an equal protection argument, but um, there's been no determination as to if these are similarly situated people uh, and uh, located in similar geographic areas. So. I want to object to that and uh, also want to remind the board that this is a de novo hearing. So we were per perilously close to wandering into testimony about what the license review board may have said or may have considered at their hearing. So that should be disregarded by this board. You make your own determination based on the evidence that you hear today. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to swear in the witnesses and then present my first witness. If you will be testifying in this hearing or believe you may be testifying, and that includes anyone who filed a written objection that would like to be heard, if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give before this proceeding? Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If so, say, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to call Sandra Richardson, please. Good morning. Good morning. Could you please tell us your full name for the record? I'm Sandra Richardson. I'm the Business License Division Manager. And what are your responsibilities in that role, Ms. Richardson? Well, of course, uh, we issue the business licenses for all the businesses throughout the county. But under that responsibility is the regulated businesses, such as the alcohol application. And, and are you, how long have you worked in that position, by the way? Since 2013. And where were you employed prior to that? I was still employed by community development. I was the assistant to the director. Okay. Are you familiar with the proposed establishment called Paprika under the corporate entity of Casbah Corporation Limited that is the subject of this hearing today? Yes, sir, I am. And how are you familiar with them? We've actually had two applications. Um, the first one was eventually withdrawn and then we've got this application that's under consideration today. And those were applications for alcohol licenses? Yes, sir. Is that correct? And was the application um, for beer and wine is for all alcohol? What was the application for? This application is for liquor, beer, wine, and Sunday sales pouring license. Okay. So if you don't mind, if you could just briefly walk us through the history of that application, because I believe that it was originally, and Ms. Morshower alluded to this, going to be more of a nightclub type establishment or hookah bar, is that correct? And now it's being proposed as a restaurant? What, what's the history of that? Yeah, so the first application had some um, information in it. It was called a hookah bar, actually. And there was information in there that there may be dancing, late hours, um, um, uh, bands, live entertainment, things that were more leaning toward a nightclub atmosphere than a normal restaurant atmosphere. Okay. And was that the application that was withdrawn? Yes, sir. That one was eventually withdrawn. And what took its place? Um, this new application that's under consideration today. Okay. And I assume that your office reviewed this application when it was presented to you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you find any disqualifying criteria or elements to this that would have automatically required a denial at the administrative level of this application? No, sir. This application uh, was 
pretty straightforward as to a restaurant. Um, the name had changed. It was the Casbah Corporation Limited, but it was the new name was Paprika, which was more of a restaurant. And um, there were no distance issues based on the there was a there was a zoning case and there was a a site plan that was to be approved by the district commissioner and a landscape plan and things of that nature that was the land that was the plan that was presented with this application with this application the reason there was no distance issue is that with the renovations have moved the door and by the moving of the door and the renovations that they're proposed in that in that um, site plan, uh, the distance issue went away. And that was a distance from the nearby residence, is that yes, correct? Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm going to hand you a certified copy of a document that uh, I've already shared with the opposing counsel. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. This is a certified copy of the zoning. Um, the other business, item 32, from the zoning case. Okay. This was from July 19th, 2016, correct? Yes, sir. And this, um, I believe, incorporated the stipulations for the business as it was seeking its rezoning. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and I believe you started to recite some of those uh, stipulations that were attached to this application in bold there at the bottom of the first page. And while you're doing that, I'm going to hand these to the clerk to be distributed. These are copies of this certified document. Can you read those for us briefly? The stipulations? Yes. Uh, the first stipulation is that the district commissioner was to approve the final site plan, the landscape plan, the lighting plan, the building architecture, the interior layout, and the parking plan. Number two, the nightclub use is prohibited. Number three, no outside entertainment music, speakers, or paging system was allowed. Number four, all activity is to be contained inside the building with the exception of an outside patio dining only. Number five, hours of operation are to be 11 o'clock a.m. until 10 o'clock p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 o'clock a.m. until 10.30 on Friday and Saturday. Number six, no tattoo parlors. Number seven, no auto sales or repair. Number eight, dumpster to be enclosed with an eight-foot wooden fence with rubber or plastic lids to reduce noise. Number nine, no dumping prior to 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m. Number 10, no idling of trucks. Number 11, all patrons must enter through a double door. The front entrance to the interior of the building to be designed to capture any interior sound. Number 12, no lighting directed toward Chatsworth subdivision or any other residence. Number 13, exhaust fans to face away from Chatsworth and towards Sandy Plains Road. Number 14, all previous stipulations and conditions not otherwise in conflict to remain in effect. Thank you. So you received this application and you also received some written objections to this application. Is that correct? That's correct. And what did you do when you received those objections? When we received timely filed objections, then that is an automatic deferment to the board of commissioner or to the license review board, excuse me. The license review board hearing is held and if it's appealed, then we end up here at the board of commissioners. Very good. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would afford an opportunity for cross-examination, and then after that, we'll let our uh, public speakers take the lectern. No questions. That's the only witness I have, Mr. Chairman. Who is it that would like to speak? Hey, uh, Who, excuse me. Yes. Can, can, uh, can we ask questions? Absolutely. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, no Absolutely. You may ask whatever questions you like. Commissioner Burrow has some questions. Okay. Um, Sandra, when this, um, when was the first application that was withdrawn? When was that submitted to the, to your office? The first. I don't have license. the actual date of the original application. I have the license review board hearing was August the eighteenth of two thousand sixteen, and then it was to come before the board of commissioners on September thirteenth of two thousand sixteen. 
So certainly the application was prior to that. Okay. I would guess somewhere maybe April. Okay. Um, it was the application was, was received May the twelfth of sixteen. Okay. So it was withdrawn before the August eighteenth LRB hearing. No, ma'am. It actually scheduled. went through the license review board. It was um, withdrawn the morning of the board of commissioners hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at that hearing, was there a distance issue less than 300 feet from Wickford Circle? Yes, ma'am, there was. Okay. At that time, in 16, this location was in District 3? Yes, ma'am. And now it is in District 2? That's correct. Um, but I do recall through the zoning and, um, and when this was initiated, that there was a distance issue, and that has since been resolved with um, relocating the entrance to be now over the 300, 302 feet. Currently, right? it's 302 feet by the survey. Okay. Commissioner um, Weatherford. You, I'm sorry, you good? Yeah. Commissioner Weatherford. Yes, do you recall what was there before this, or maybe even? Before this, yeah. it operated as a Donnie's Home Cooking it originally evidently was an old Pizza Hut. And do you recall if they had a liquor license? The Pizza Hut had an alcohol license until 1998. 98. And then Donnie's opened um, in 2006 and was there until 2015. Okay. And Donnie's did not have an alcohol license. Okay. So it has not, there has not been an alcohol license there since 1998 when the Pizza Hut closed. Okay. Well, thank you. Commissioner Cupid. Good morning. Good morning. It's still morning. This is more of a procedural question, and it could have been directed towards Attorney Hemsley. Um, there was some opposition that was provided um, for this case at the time of the License Review Board. Yes, ma'am. And um, those in opposition, they spoke at the License Review Board. Yes, ma'am. And the License Review Board, did you make a decision at that time? Yes, ma'am. What was the decision of the license? It was a 5-0 to deny. To deny. Okay. And so this hearing is as a result of an, the appeal. Yes, ma'am. The applicant appealed. Okay. Are you, um, what was the basis for denial? Well, it was based on the testimony that they heard there at the license review board. Okay. Um, Attorney Helms, when we get our books... <clears throat> that um, when things come before the Board of Commissioners on appeal for other issues, there may be a synopsis of um, why the ruling of the License Review Board was the way that it was. I think there was a, one case we had on consent where it, it had a disposition, I think, of suspension, and there was some reasoning provided as to why that suspension occurred. How is this process different? Are we able to find out what was the basis at this point? Um, actually, no, because, again, this is a deferral, so there was never any administrative consideration of this application. So it went to the License Review Board. As Ms. Richardson indicated, they listened to the testimony, the evidence, and so forth, made their recommendation. Since that was to deny, the applicant chose to appeal. So we're here on basically a de novo-type hearing mm -hmm. where we're listening to all this again. Okay. So... Yeah, the, the, the basis of, all I can say about the basis for the denial is that they considered the criteria because mm -hmm. I read the same criteria to the license review the board that I went over today. Okay. That's so that everyone would know what criteria you're to look at. And again, we won't know exactly what the issue is until the public speakers come forward and express what their concerns okay, are. Okay, thank you. That's what I'm In addition to what's in towards. your book. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Sam. Yes, sir. Just for us non-attorneys. Your de novo basically means that we are not here to determine whether or not the License Review Board made the right decision. We're here to listen to evidence presented to us and decide on that. Correct, as opposed to what's known as a record review, where you would be looking at what was decided by the lower adjudicating well, I didn't know because I did not stay at a holiday. Yes. So. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. One other procedural question. And again, this could possibly go either way. I, I didn't know an opportunity to ask you questions when you were speaking. Um, the evidence that's been provided um, in writing versus we're going to hear from witnesses today, what can we consider? Do we consider just what we hear from testimony? Do we not consider what's been provided? You can consider both. 
And that was why I read the provision in the code that said you can also take into consideration if the people that wrote those letters do not show up for the hearing. Okay. So you can grant whatever, as much weight or as little weight as you wish to those written objections. Uh, the assumption is that you're going to be granting more weight to those who come forward and actually participate in the hearing to express their concerns before the board that they may have already expressed in, in the letters. That's why they're in your agenda packet, so that you yes. can take a okay. look at Yes, okay, I didn't know what, what we could do with that today. Okay, thank you. At this point, whoever would like to speak that did file a timely written objection, if you would come forward, state your name and address for the record, please, and you'll have three minutes to talk. Good morning. My name is Lisa Hansen. Um, I live in Chatsworth subdivision, which is directly behind the property we're talking about. And I'm the homeowner's president. I'm here representing not only Chatsworth, but also Jefferson Park and Jefferson Township, two neighborhoods that are nearby, and, and also the 600 people who a year ago signed a petition in opposition of this business coming in. Um, this will be the fourth time, actually, that I've either been before you all or before the License Review Committee. Um, as it was noted, it was denied twice, and I really believe that the reasons why the liquor license was denied was because there were so many red flags. Um, I know her attorney has mentioned, you know, distance is not an issue now, um, and that is a result of them moving the front door just recently to over 300 feet. Um, something that I just want to address and put on the record that her attorney said is that this applicant has been targeted, and that's definitely not the fact. We are all for a renovated building going in behind us. But over a year ago, this applicant wanted to open a nightclub, and on her initial liquor license application, she said it was a restaurant when very clearly it was a nightclub. And there were certain things historically that happened with this. They started work on it before it was approved. They had to have a stop work order. There were just several things that made us cautious and question whether or not this applicant was following law. Because I believe that with a liquor license, that's a privilege. And I think, you know, if you can't follow rules and laws, that should be something that is a red flag. So it's my hope that you'll consider these factors today. One is, according to the code 6106, there is evidence that parking and traffic will be an issue. Um, currently, there is overflow from the movie tavern, which went in a couple of years ago, and El Hinete on weekends. People are parking in this parking lot. There's at least five or 10 cars given any weekend. And when we addressed that with the attorney at the meeting that they requested the neighborhood to have, she, she said that they would have valet parking because of that. They were going to ensure with valet parking that people wouldn't park in that lot. So my question is, will the valet parkers be going across four lanes of Sandy Plains to park cars? Or will they be parking cars behind the shopping center, you know, directly impacting the neighborhood? So, Valet parking really, to me, is not an issue. Also, um, I do have a, a, a study that came from the DOT actually this morning. This is the crash report for um, all crashes that have occurred at this particular location. My husband actually was rear-ended here a couple years ago. And the problem is you've got, all, you've got a four-lane road, and I've got a picture of this location. You've got a four-lane road, and the only exit an entrance into this is one way. The only exit is going north. And if people want to go south on Sandy Plains, they have to make a U-turn. There's also, if you see coming north from that picture, people are going traveling quite fast on Sandy Plains Road. I know the, um, they've had the... Okay. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Your, your time is up. But on this map here, on this picture, is, is are one of these... Picture of one of the establishments? Yes. It's the, the one, one behind the sign. Directly behind the sign, yes. Okay, all right. So is, is that that the end unit? No, there's a no, there's a restaurant that's on the corner. Right. That's not on an end unit. Okay. All right, thank you. Chairman, may I ask for a question? Sure, go ahead, Commissioner Cooper. Yes, and um, follow up. I believe this restaurant's being proposed in a shopping plaza versus a standalone building. Correct. Okay. 
Is this the um? Well, it's is in a it's in a shopping plaza, but it's, it's standalone. It's standalone within. It's a part shopping. of DDR's property. Who okay. is the property owner? And this is an existing building. Yes. Okay. And, and on this map, where is your development? Behind it? It's behind it. There's the right. trees behind the building. Mm -hmm. There's okay. a retention area, but those trees in the wintertime lose their leaves. So you see directly into the back of that. Okay. And There's what's, no buffer. What's down to the right of that building? What's what's in those buildings? That's a that's, that's a the firestone. firestone? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see now. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank may you. I, may I follow Commissioner up? Weather? I'm sorry. sorry. Do you have one more yeah. question? Yes. Um, just curious to know, um, has this unit ever been fully occupied? It was a Donnie's home cooking. I know it had something else in this particular space, but um, I'm curious to know, has it ever just been fully occupied? It's just one unit. No, not, no. Okay, so help me understand here, because I'm trying to understand the parking issue. Yes, yes. Um, this isn't a okay. So I asked if this isn't a shopping plaza. It's a standalone building within a shopping center. Yes, it it adjoins to the shopping center. And when the movie tavern gets going on the weekends, there's no parking. So you've got overflow parking. You've got cars parking on the curbs. And even the manager at the Dollar Tree, which is several doors down from the movie tavern, told me that on weekends she has people parked on the curb to mm -hmm. drop people off, and it's a fire hazard. She's had to go out and tell people to move their cars because they're parking in a fire lane. Okay. So we're going to have a huge issue with parking, and particularly now that they've said that they want to have outdoor seating, they'll be taking a few more of those parking spaces mm -hmm. to put their outdoor seating. Okay. So we're concerned that traffic is either going to be rerouted to the back for parking mm -hmm. or with the valets, like they've suggested. They'll be crossing four lanes to park in other parking lots. I see. And the movie tavern wasn't operating at the same time that this building was occupied in the past? No, the movie tavern was added after I moved in in 19 or in 2000. The movie tavern's fairly new. So okay. on the record, while Ms. Morchauer said that we should have known what was back there when we bought our homes, the movie tavern was not zoned when I bought my home. So okay. that went up in... Um, Elevation quite high, and the whole shopping center changed because there had been a empty Stein Mart behind us. So there was no traffic back there. Okay. And just for the record, also DDR, I live 25 feet from behind the movie tavern. Mm -hmm. DDR, the owner, has never followed the stipulations that were put in place back when the movie tavern was bought. And that's another one of our fears that we're constantly having to either call. Code enforcement, there were over nine or over 385 emails to code enforcement because they, we were having trash pickup at 2, 3, and 4 a.m. in the morning, okay. idling trucks. So it's been constant. And so these were just some of the reasons why when initially okay. she came in and wanted okay. to. Sorry. Commissioner Weatherford. All right, I'm a, I'm a little confused. They're parking, overflow parking, but if this became an establishment, it would be private parking for that establishment, so that would eliminate some of the issues you're discussing, unless I'm missing something. If they have somebody policing that, is well, my... Well, but it seems to me your issue is with existing conditions, not with what this business is going to cause. You sound like you have a lot of problems already that should be addressed in a different form and there has are. no impact or bearing there are. to me on this particular case. Correct. And it would seem to me that the Firestone down there would cause a lot of noise and traffic and issues as well, that you was there when you moved in, was it not? It was. Okay, so. Uh, it, they closed at I, 7. I mean, I, I'm, I just don't, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but mm -hmm. I don't think this is the root of your problem. Okay. That's all. And unless I'm missing something, I'm giving you the opportunity to tell me that. But <laughs> well, uh, whether Firestone they valet or whether they at, private parking or whatever, if I own that business, no one would park there but my clients or patrons. And um, it seems like, you know, we have an issue beyond this that needs to be addressed. And I right. hope we can do that. But. There is most definitely. And again, it, it surprises me that somebody would want to move into this location because there are going to be numerous issues. But again, I think our... our uh, Board, this board is supposed to determine whether this is legitimate and legal, if it's criteria, not why they want to do it or what they want to do it, et cetera. Fair enough. Okay. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, just, and I may be off base here, and I, and I respect Commissioner Weatherford's comments, but 
we haven't heard from both sides yet, and I think that we, as the people that are going to make a decision, shouldn't be telling what our thoughts are until we've heard both sides, because we could be determining what testimony is given moving forward based on the comments we're making. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to no, I mean, I, I agree with you, and I understand what you're asking. My concern is I want to hear what the witnesses have to say um, based on what they have to say, not based on what we're saying. Okay. I don't want I don't want testimony to be skewed towards what they think that we want to hear. Okay. Well, I apologize. I don't think that's what I was doing. I was clarifying one of our main issues, trying to apply it to the rules and law that we were given. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that, you know, I got my questions answered. So. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. And now Ms. Moshera may have some cross-examination questions, which she is entitled, if you don't mind, if you do you need to ask her anything. No. Okay. I believe we have one more public speaker, Mr. Chairman. Hi, my name is Adele Ayers, and uh, my husband and I are also uh, from Chatsworth. We had written a letter, a petition against uh, this business um, in particular. And I would just like to pretty much just give a few points because this is a long ongoing situation that we've been dealing with since 2015. And, you know, for them to finally reach out in 2017 to, we are fairly confident, we'll be neighbors, I think that that's a point that I'd like to make, that it took two years to actually reach out to the people that would, you know, that have had the opposition. And I think that's something that, you know, attributes to um, that we're not necessarily attacking her or against her at all. It's a matter of the beginning representation of this business being a um, nightclub open till 2 a.m. on Friday and Saturday evenings with a dance floor. That's what started this whole process. We have nothing against a bar or a restaurant serving alcohol or even hookah for that matter. It's a matter of the hours of the business and the impact that it will have on our neighborhood that's directly behind them. So that's where this mainly comes from is our concern. Um, we also like to note that the restaurants and bars that were mentioned before, such as Keegan's or Seed, we don't have those people here that live behind those places to represent themselves to discuss their issues that they might have. Um, so I don't think that it's fair to bring that up, even though they legally got their license. I think that those people probably would have something to say if they were here to represent themselves. Um, I also do believe that the... Um, Restaurants and bars that are currently, or that do serve alcohol, that are in that neighborhood right now, that are in the DDR, Sandy Plains Village, they have openings towards the street, towards 92. They have a building that blocks any noise. This does have an open seating that will have, will have if, if the stipulations aren't upheld, could cause a situation of noise being loud and due to their closeness to our neighborhood. So these other places are blocked by a building. We don't hear their noise. We don't hear any comings and goings because their businesses face a, a different direction from our neighborhoods and our backyards. Um, I'd also like to just mention that, you know, hopefully in the case that if these, you know, if the stipulations, you know, I hope that, you know, DDR and this restaurant will adhere to the stipulations that this board's put in place. Um, we are not against this restaurant or bar necessarily, but we are just worried that the that we will be the ones upholding the stipulations. We as the neighbors will be will be policing. And we're worried that we won't have any recourse if there are things that aren't, you know, upheld and they don't follow these stipulations. So unfortunately, we feel like this might be a burden then on Cobb County's police force to then be the ones that um, we have to call continuously. So um, hopefully we'll all take that in consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay. You're up. Um, we have the other side, right? Can I just use that? Okay. Okay, my first witness is Naseeb Raina.
can you tell this board your full name and where you live? Miss um, C. Brana, and I live in 110 Rehoboth Circle, Atlanta, Georgia. Have you ever lived in Cobb County before? I have. I actually graduated from Lasseter High School, so I was there for a while. I still have friends over there, and um, I'm pretty familiar with the neighborhood, with the Marietta area. And um, did you go to college? And yes, I have a marketing degree from Georgia State. And um, have you ever had a license to sell alcohol in the past? Before? I've had two licenses, alcohol licenses under my name. So I understand the responsibility of having a liquor license. I've never had any issues. Never, my family and I have always been in in business. So we have always had liquor licenses. We never had in, any issues. And the neighbors keep on addressing that I was supposed to open a nightclub. I never tried to open a nightclub. I, yes, I wanted longer hours, I wanted to have hookah, I wanted to bring something different to the neighborhood. My intention was never to have a nightclub. And once I heard the feedback that they don't want something like this, I changed it. All I'm trying to do is open a nice, friendly restaurant, neighborhood restaurant. And it's not going to be any different than the other establishments in that area. I don't understand how a small restaurant like mine is going to make such a big impact on their neighborhood when they have so many other businesses and bigger establishments like the movie tavern. And I don't understand why, and they're addressing the parking issue. Mine's going to be a private parking. I'm having valet parking. And if anything, it's going to help. Like he said, it's going to help with it. I'm going to keep more, you know, I'm, going to, I'm not going to allow any other cars to park. And that's why I'm having the valet parking over there. So um, I just don't understand why my small restaurant will make such a big impact. Like I said, there's so many other businesses there. And uh, I'm just trying to open a restaurant. I mean, they keep on going back to the past. This is not what, and I don't understand why I'm being targeted for that. This is completely different. It's a new business. And they keep on talking about the past, and I haven't even met with them. And I'm said, and I address, I try to talk to them, and they address their concerns, and I'm willing to work with them. And like I said, I'm, I want to make them happy because I want a successful business. This is something that I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to open a business, a restaurant, actually. I have friends who own, have restaurants, and this is, I don't want to fail at this. And I, I'm willing to make them happy. I'm willing to do anything they want. And they were talking about the landscape. We have revised the whole landscape. We added buffers. Um, the patio is even facing the road. The patio is not going to be facing the neighborhood, so there's no noise that's going to be going to the neighborhood from the patio. It's a very small seated patio. It's only 20 people. And there's, I don't know how many, how much noise that's going to create. There's no outside music. There's no DJs. There's nothing. It's just a restaurant, just like the others. And they keep on complaining about the past, and it's, this is not the past. This is the present. And I'm, I want to make them happy. The, the other issues they have, that's from the businesses that already exist. And, you know, this is a business that has not been open. So how are they assuming all these problems are going to be happening when this business is not even open yet? So they're just assuming these problems from the previous businesses or the businesses that are already there. And like I said, it's just a small restaurant with a small patio. There's no music. There's no live music, no DJ. It's going to be the hours is from 11 to 10 and 10.30 on the weekends. So I should not be targeted for the past, for what I was intended of opening. This is not that. This is just a restaurant like the other restaurants in that neighborhood. And that's all I want to say. I'm going to show you some pictures, and I want you to identify what it is. Um, okay. So is that the restaurant location? Yes. Okay, and is that where, show us where the patio is going to the be. The patio is going to be... It's gonna be in the, it's gonna be in the front right there. Right here. Oh, sorry. It's gonna be in the front right there. So and the neighborhood is back there. So the trap. So the patio is gonna be facing the road right there on Sandy Plain. So there's, if there is gonna be any noise, it's gonna be going towards Sandy Plains Road, not towards the neighbors, which are towards the back of me. And like I said, it's only 20 people. It's just gonna see 20 people there. How much noise is that gonna create? with no music, no live DJ, with nothing. How, um, how many tables can sit on the patio? Uh, only 20 people, so it's going to be four tables. I think it's five. I think it's five. Yeah, five with, with four seating. Right. Yeah, just... And this is, this is an aerial view. I've got several aerial views, actually, of the location. So the, red the place where the red 
right little there. dot is marked mm -hmm. is, the is the actual building. If you move your finger to the right, right here, this is the cul-de-sac uh -huh. right there. There's a big screen of, of buffering right there, which mm -hmm. I understand might lose some foliage in the winter time, but there is a screen there. There's also, I think, a water, some kind of water, I don't know if it's a reservoir, but there is some kind of water feature, not, not a pond, but some kind of dip in that property right there. So the there's a pretty the big buffering. Now the, the homes do not, if you look at that, you can see the homes do not back up to my neighbor, my uh, client's backyard. They back up to the Firestone. They're catty corner to my neighbor's, my, uh, I keep saying that, my applicant's property. She does not, her property does not back up to no. the residences, the, the Firestone. Firestone. And, and you can see, because I've been there myself, Firestone employees and, and other people coming there park behind the Firestone all the time. There's constant parking. They have a dumpster. Um, so the issues are already there. The parking issues, the noise that comes from the shopping center, that whole this whole line of rooftops right here, that's the shopping center. And their homes right here. They're right up against the shopping center. But they've been there for, for a very long time. I, I think they were built in the 90s, and the shopping center was there too. So this is an ongoing issue that has no, my client's application would not have any impact on what's already going on there. Um, here's a better view. Let me show you this one. That's a probably a better view. That's the the um, back of her parking lot is right here. And we have a new landscape plan, which Commissioner Ott hasn't even seen yet, but I, I told Ms. Swanson in your office about it. We've And I've got it with me today. We can add seven trees right here. And that's, that's the shopping center right there. So really, the buffer is going to be to the shopping center. But it's going to put in um, a buffer right here to keep the light or anything that the neighborhood would, would say is a problem away from their neighborhood. The neighbors are way over here. I mean, it's, it's not that far of a distance. But they're back behind this. This is the Firestone. So they're actually over here. The shopping center backs up to my client's property because this is the um, corner of the, of the long strip of the shopping center. And there are dumpsters back here, and I've got pictures of those too. So there's already a bunch of dumpsters that are back here, and the neighbors are right over here. So this is Sandy Plains Road right here. This is a very busy road, and Jefferson Township, which I object to Ms. Hansen representing Jefferson Township. She doesn't live there, and I think that was... Um, that she could not make comments for, Je I don't think she can make comments for anybody who are not here, frankly. So I object to any um, comments that she represented were made on behalf of other people. But I understand she's the homeowner association in uh, Chatsworth. But Jefferson Township is down, down Sandy Plains on the other side of the street. So here's my finger, but you gotta go way down here. I don't know exactly how far down, but it's across, across a pretty big road. It's a four lane road with a median. So they're down the other end of the street. I don't know how they could be concerned about what happens here. Um, I have other pictures if you want to see. Um, I don't know that they're going to give you any better view, but there's, there's a house. I think that's the closest, closest house right there, and it's behind the Firestone. It's not behind my client's property. Now, the, their, their property, I guess, goes in an angle right here. But the house itself is not. And then there's this big amount of buffering right in the middle, right there. And I have pictures of what that looks like, too. So let me, let me show you that. Because I took pictures of the, the back of the property. So you can see how the buffering looks. We have a good idea what you're talking about as far as the material facilities here. Okay. So, you know, we, we, we get your point on that. Okay. Because I do the, have the, a lot the, of pictures with no, trees. No, the pictures have been very illuminating and, uh, and illustrative. So, but, but I get your point. Okay. I also, um, 
I think Ms. Reina has said everything I needed her to say. Is there anything else you want to add? Okay. Um, we have a traffic engineer who actually performed a traffic study because I didn't know what to anticipate here, but I wanted to show you that there will be minimal, minimal impact. Um, can you state your name, please? My name is Mark Acampora. I am a Georgia professional engineer, and my area of expertise is traffic engineering, and I've been practicing in Metro Atlanta, including Cobb County, for a little over 25 years. Can you tell the board um, what you did in regard to this application? Uh, two issues, uh, parking and, and then the traffic volumes that are generated by this project. Uh, I heard a few comments about the parking issues on this property. It's my understanding that the proposed, this project will be in compliance with the parking requirements. There is an existing parking issue of the other users of the shopping center parking in this property. And the client's way of addressing that is to make this valet parking, which means that those other folks won't be parking in this property. So that's, a, that's an issue related to the other tenants in the shopping center. This property will be valet parking, and valet is even more efficient than self-parking, so uh, it doesn't appear that parking is going to be an issue. There's going to be more parking provided than the code requirement. Also, um, I looked at the trip generation of this project, and we use, we, we use an, a reference called the Trip Trip Generation Manual by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, ninth edition, which is the current edition. Um, and I made a projection of the volume of trips that would come in and out of this property during peak times. In the morning peak time, the traffic is going to be negligible because the restaurant's not going to be open for morning activity. It's going to open at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there is a token amount of traffic that the trip generation shows. Two cars will come in and two cars will come out during the morning peak hour. Um, and that might be an employee or an owner or something like that. And the PM peak hour, the evening of the highest impact, there, there are two components to the amount of trips that'll come in and out. There are the total trips that'll come in and out of the driveway, and there are the new trips that'll be on the adjacent street. And the, new, the total trips is made up of the new trips plus what are called pass-by trips. Those are people that are already driving by on Sandy Plains Road or Woodstock Road and will be turning into the shopping center on their way home from work, maybe to get a drink or to get dinner or something like that. So I wanted to put the magnitude of these numbers of trips. The amount of total trips that are going to come in and out of the driveway during the highest hour, the PM peak hour, will be 21 entering trips and 11 exiting trips. Of that, seven of the entering trips will be pass-by trips. So seven of the cars that are already driving by on Sandy Plains Road will now turn into the shopping center and then, uh, into this restaurant and then turn out of it within that PM peak hour time period. So of new cars that will be on the road because of this restaurant during the highest hour of activity, there will be 14 new inbound cars and seven new outbound cars. So I just wanted to put that in order of magnitude. Just for, just for reference, the, the daily traffic volume on Sandy Plains Road um, in 2016 was 24,800 cars. So we're going to be adding in the PM peak hour 14 new inbound cars and seven outbound cars. And I, I don't know if you have the graphic of that, but what's very telling is when you take that traffic and you actually then what we do is called trip distribution and we look at the market area of the restaurant where that traffic will travel to and from. And based on those projections uh, of the trip distribution, the percentage of where these folks are gonna come to and from, the numbers basically, you can see on the screen, coming up to the north, northeast bound on Sandy Plains Road in the PM peak hour will be six new cars. And going back southwest bound on Sandy Plains Road will be three new cars in the PM peak hour. Coming to and from, I guess, the northwest on Woodstock Road will be two cars in an hour. And outbound will be two cars in an hour. To and from the east on Woodstock Road, you have four inbound cars in an hour and one outbound car. And then on Mabry Road to the right, you have two northbound cars and one southbound car. Um, and the Chatsworth subdivision is where that one and two are on the right. That's kind of an entrance to that. Some of the folks that 
that one and two cars represent may be residents of that neighborhood themselves. There are people that are just going to and from the restaurant in that direction. So as a professional engineer, my overall opinion is that the impact of this project on traffic is going to be imperceptible to the motoring public. We're talking about one, two, four, the highest number is six cars that spread out over an hour in the PM peak hour. So I think the, my opinion is that the, tra the traffic impact of this project is going to be negligible. Oh, for, the, for which one? Yeah, we can bring her back if you want. It's up, yeah. Is it the witness for, for the for this for the? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the order. Right there. I I have a few more things I just wanted to put in let you see. Um, I have pictures of other locations that are very similar to this. Um, Seed is in the shopping center. I, I can show you those pictures if you think I, sh I should or not. <laughs> I don't no, want to take We want to stay specific to this area. I know okay. where the seed is and it's not near here. So I okay. think I just we, wanted we to have a great idea of what the area looks like and what the traffic issues are. You've been very good at presenting your, your, your side of the, uh, of the issue. So uh, but I think we should stay focused just on this area right here. Okay, here's the some pictures, um, and I can call Miss Raina back, but I forgot to ask her. These are pictures that she is in, she has been looking at and hoping to duplicate inside the interior, and it's a very descriptive view of how she wants to design it, and she is working with an architect as um, well. I'm not really sure, Ms. John, I know Mr. Murrow wants to see him, but I'm not really sure what that has to do with an alcohol license. Yeah. I mean, this is turning into a zoning hearing instead right. of an alcohol right. hearing. Okay. Um, I appreciate the pictures, but as we've mentioned, there's a whole lot of stipulations that dictate what it can look like, how it can operate, and those are all in the zoning decision. Right. We're here to just decide on alcohol license, and yeah. I just feel like this is turning into a zoning hearing. Yeah. Well, well my well, point for this was to show that it's not a nightclub. No, I, I understand that. Not. But, but the, stipulation, the stipulation says it won't be a nightclub. Right, right, right. I know. So and and that's taken care those of. Those interior designs have to be approved by the district commissioner, which I already have done. And you have. Right, and so the, those things have been followed, as this board approved in the zoning hearing, and those stipulations and conditions and what the interior is going to look like and everything else, which you're going okay. to show us, uh, that's already been approved. Would you want to see the menu or the chef's resume? No. Well, yeah, I've done that. No, I'm okay. not going to show us all that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling things are going a bit aw awry here. Um, you know, I understand what the board is sharing. I also believe that the things that she's sharing are, are at issue because we're talking about the the character of the space, and um, these are things that we've considered in other hearings for alcohol. We've considered the layout. We've considered how much um, space is going to be dedicated to people eating versus drinking to kind of get the nature of the space. So uh, I, I'm not opposed to it. I mean, it doesn't add additional time that may not be um, that may not necessarily. Um, lead us one way or another, it could potentially do that, but I don't see these things necessarily not being um, pertinent to this conversation when they've been considered before. So I just think she has, she should have the ability to make a compelling case um, in, in response to the, the denial. Well, m but my understanding, the criteria is section 6-106, all right? That's, that's our criteria, right? So we're looking at these and they're, they're, that, that, those criteria, what she's trying to present here, are not in this, in these, uh, in these, uh, in these standards. And how you interpret that, Chairman? Because you could look at, could it create a difficulty? And well, okay, and, well, just, you know, show, you if, you, just if, you can, if you can align one of these criteria with what she's trying to do, then we'll let her present her case. Again, it's not for me. It, I just feel I have an issue with us having a hearing and people being able to present, just like the applicant should be able to, I mean, those who have questions about the site, why is it coming? They should have the ability to present their case, and the applicant should have the ability to present their case. If we have an issue with what's presented, let's ask questions. But just coming in and removing people's ability to make uh, to make their own case, so we can 
take all of that objectively as bothering. I feel like we could be, we are involving ourselves in their ability to provide testimony. You know, and I just, that someday it's not good. Again, I, I disagree. And because as um, Mr. Hensley pointed out, he directed the board that we had to stay within the confines of 106. I agree. And the applicant's attorney has raised objections numerous times for this people speaking moving outside of that. And then she has even agreed. And we've said to her that some of these other restaurants she's talking about are outside of that. So to just allow everybody to talk about whatever they want is moving outside of what we've been instructed from the very beginning right. of what we're supposed to be looking at. We just and haven't given her the opportunity to make the connection or not. But, there, but there's no reason to make the connection because it's not part of the criteria. You don't that, know until she makes her argument. Well, this is an administrative hearing, all right? So the bottom line is our guideline is section 106. You don't and, know and, if she Unless we stay within 106, then we're wandering the field. You said and, unless if. You have not gotten to consider if until she speaks on that point. Well, you'll have your opportunity when you question, you know, at, at our, we, the board gets time to ask questions, and at that time, you can bring anything to the conversation that you want to. Asking questions right? is different than her presenting information. No, you can bring her back. Her case. Why would I bring her back not knowing what she wanted to share? That's what I'm saying. Well, I you could simply bring her and say, please come up here and, and give all those opportunities to share that we didn't allow you to share before. You, you have wide discretion as to what you want her to talk about. Okay. Procedure, right? Procedurally, Chairman. Okay. Well, I, I, your, 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 your comments are noted, but I think that unless your comments address 106, then we're not we're not we're not complying with the guidelines of providing this by the attorney. And all I am saying is she should have the opportunity to determine whether or not she's providing something to address it. She mentioned something having to do with the menu. Let her determine let her try to make that nexus or not and then let us say there's no nexus there versus us just coming in and saying it's not relevant just because we heard us just because we heard something right. stated that's not specifically there. So, so Mr. Hemsley, what that. is what is the nexus of the menu with this with the criteria that is for her to no no it's for the law, lawyer to decide no no she is an attorney she, but he's the attorney that we hired to guide us so if you can establish the nexus for the menu then we'll go ahead with it i'm curious about that too mr chairman but i really can't make a judgment until i mean ms morshower may state right now in her place, that it really doesn't have anything to do with these criteria. I don't know. I understand that she's trying to establish that it's not a nightclub. It, we exactly. know that. Exactly. And because it's I've in seen the, the menu. I've right. seen the menu, had the discussion yeah. with the attorney. Um, the fact that whether it's a nightclub or not a nightclub, that is a stipulation that it cannot be a nightclub. So whether or not the menu shows whether or not it's a nightclub, they've already said it's not going to be a nightclub. The stipulations say it can't be a nightclub. The menu shows that it's not going to be a nightclub. The menu shows that it's going to be a restaurant, which is why the menu was approved with the interior designs and all the things that Ms. Rana's attorney submitted as required by the stipulations to the district commissioner. We have had numerous conversations back and forth with information going back and forth as required by the stipulations, and never once has she told me that she did not get fair treatment um, with the information being reviewed. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, and I'm willing to, if, if you're okay with it, stipulate that those all, all those things have been agreed to and approved by Commissioner Ott, so they're all um, okay. part of the record. Right. So if I you. may, it, in the interest of, of cutting to the chase here, if Ms. Morshower has any other exhibits related to the menu or whatever that she would like to enter into the record without us going into it, I'm not going to object to that if she argues that it has some relevance to whether it's a nightclub or not. In the interest of a potential record review, if this were to be appealed to the Superior Court, if this body decided to deny the license application. In that case, it would be part of the record, right. and then we don't have to ask a bunch of questions about it. I would have no objection to that. I'm good with that. Okay. And, and any other record, quite honestly, that would go to her case? I mean, the issue here is the license, license review, and I think the points that were originally brought out have all been addressed, and now we're just starting to go to some, some secondary issues that I don't think deal with the, license, the liquor issue. The liquor issue is directly stated by 106. The only question that we should be answering is, does it, is it in compliance with 106? Correct. If it is, we should, you know, it should be approved. If it isn't, we sh it should be denied. And I agree. for the board to decide. Yes, sir. 
I'm, okay. I'm basically finished. I just wanted to make a comment about the fact that um, Mr. Hensley objected to the evidence about other places. I do think that there is a direct correlation because those other places that I mentioned and have pictures of um, and are part of my little packet, those are right up against residential properties just like the residences right. here and any issues that they have in this neighborhood they're experiencing the same ones in the other neighborhoods and they got licenses that's that's and i just want to that's part of my equal protection sure argument. But, <laughs> so but i just but, have to say it but i heard you talk about those very specifically in your opening argument right. in the open discussion so those are already in the record we heard you about that i think anything else you'd well, say well the about evidence that. itself is the i'd have to put that evidence in if it were to be reviewed but we'll stipulate more. the evidence okay yeah that's Okay. But, uh, but I think what we're trying to do here is we hear you, and we believe you. I, I understand, I, and I'm what finished. I, what I'm trying to hear people is that <laughs> I'm there's done. a sense of that we don't, we don't believe. No, why would we not believe you? And you, you, made, your, you, made, you made a point. You have the evidence to support it, it's, and we're going to stipulate it. Um, and I, I think that everything you're trying to do here, you've accomplished. Okay. You know, without, Mr. Chairman, if, if I might, because she is trying to perfect the record in case there is a review. Right. I mean, I, I do think that rather than the evidence being stipulated, it ought to be at for the record. For the record. Well, okay. Well, I meant that. I agree. Yeah. We'll make it. If I need to, I'll put it into a yeah. record. Well, just, Thank you. Sure. Am I making closing arguments now? Or? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm at my closing argument. Um, certainly, community opposition is important, and it's got to be, you want har harmony in a neighborhood. And my client say, stated she wants this neighborhood and the other ones to like her restaurant because if they don't, she's not going to succeed and she's going to close. Um, so she's relying on these people to like her restaurant and make a good business out of it. Um, when you look at Section 10, uh, sorry, 6 106, and you look at the criteria, I don't think any of it was proven by the other side today. Um, there is no evidence that um, in subsection, well, let me go, let me look at the exact language of the code, so I'm not saying it wrong. There is no um, evidence that there will be a creation of difficulty in police supervision at this location. There is um, no evidence that the area is already adequately supplied with licenses, and I also think that that section, sec subsection three, is unconstitutionally vague and does not provide any ascertainable standards as to what that means, adequately supplied, is, is vague and ambiguous. Um, there is case law about that. Um, there's cases in Georgia that say that if you, a county can limit the number of licenses, but it has to be done on specific grounds, and you have to you have to come up with a way to do that. It can't just be this board decides, you know, on one application that there's too many licenses in an area and and decides not to issue one because of that. There's got to be specific. Um, rationale and reason as to how you do that. So I think that section's unconstitutionally vague and ambiguous, and it wasn't proven today. I don't even know if they addressed that today, but it was at the board license review board. Um, the evidence that the lo location would be detrimental to the property values in the area was not at all addressed today, or there was no evidence at that, of that at all. And the evidence that the license in that location would be detrimental to traffic conditions um, or that there was a lack of sufficient parking would result in parking on the streets or adjoining property, that was not proven today. Um, in fact, we showed otherwise with our traffic study and the fact that we'll have that. We have adequate parking. The county's already signed off on our parking plan. We actually could add more parking. We have space to add more parking. But, but my client wants to do valet parking, and sh we think that will be more effective and, and help the whole parking situation in the whole shopping center. Um, and I believe those are the only things that were addressed during this hearing. I don't think six, seven, or eight, or nine of that section were addressed, and I, I don't think there was any evidence regarding it. So I do not think that the um, community opposition met its requirements under this code section. And for that reason, I respectfully request that you grant this license and let her open this restaurant. Okay. Thank you. Sure. For who? For the lawyer? Oh, I have certified copies of the code sections, too. I've already talked to Mr. Hensley about various okay. parts of the record. We, uh, The application itself as well, I need to redact it if I have to put it in. So he and I okay. agreed to that. We're going to have we're going to have clever remarks, Mr. Hensley, and then the board can call anybody they want to talk to about, about their issues. So we're not going to limit discussion here. I just want to stay within the boundaries of the format here. And just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, I think the evidence pretty much speaks for itself. I do want to tender into evidence 
the certified copy of the zoning stipulations that we discussed earlier. I know these were relevant just to the to the business location itself, but I think they address a lot of these issues that were uh, the concerns that were raised by the property owners. So I do want to enter in this into the record and just want to say that I hope the applicant understands that violating any of these conditions could result in a thousand dollar a day fine for every day they they continue and could potentially lead to shutting down of the business. So these are very, very important. I think they address not only the conduct of the business itself, but also the um, privilege of serving alcohol at this establishment. So I will offer that into evidence, and that's uh, the conclusion of my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cupid. Go I'm gonna go down the line here for comments. Well, how about it's it's in District Two. How, you know, normally we would let the District Commissioner. Make okay, all right. No, I mean, I just she was very I, concerned I, about. I just I would like to kind of okay. frame it first right, from okay. a district right. perspective. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm sure you have comments too, having dealt with it earlier. Um, I think there's a lot of different things here that, but the number one thing is emotion has kind of worked its way into this, and that's not where it should be. Um, the first thing I want to address is Ms. Rana. You kept um, referencing being targeted. Targeted is a very big word, okay? And when I mentioned earlier that this was turning into a zoning hearing instead of an alcohol hearing, one of the things, you know, bad service in a restaurant leaves a bad impression with people that come in there, and difficult zoning cases leave a bad impression with people in the neighborhood. And, and unfortunately, it takes a long time for that to settle out. And so it is not a matter of targeting, it's just, there's a lot of issues that these folks in this neighborhood have dealt with, not necessarily with you, but with just the people that own the shopping center, with the movie tavern, with the noise, with the idling trucks. We heard a lot about that. And, and in the office, myself and my assistant hear about it all the time. And it was a very difficult zoning case. Commissioner Burl dealt with it in the beginning. Then it, you know, after she dealt with it with all these stipulations, then it moved to District 2. So it's, it's targeting, I, I don't think that's, necessarily what's happening. What you're seeing is just a result of a very difficult zoning hearing and too much of the zoning hearing worked its way into today. So, um, yeah. you know, you heard that um, these folks, they, they don't want an empty building. That That's part of the problem. I mean, and, you know, empty buildings, you know, are the downfall of a neighborhood. So the fact that you're going to come in and, and like I said, I've seen the interior, exterior, landscaping, menus, everything about your restaurant, and I've signed off on all of it. So I know that what you're trying to do is, is good and that you, your heart is in it and I commend you for the effort and especially your attorney in getting all the information that she was required to get. Um, I also want to commend the neighborhoods. It's been a long road, but like you just heard me say, I think that a little bit too much of the zoning concerns work themselves into today. Um, the, the parking and traffic concerns we have to let the restaurant open before we can find out. And, and one of the things in this uh, section 6-106, the title of it is additional standards for issuance, renewal, or transfer or denial of retail um, license. All right, Ms. Rana has to renew her license every year. If indeed there are concerns or that traffic becomes an issue, parking becomes an issue, and those cannot be resolved between Ms. Rana and staff um, then those can be addressed at that time. But right now, to say that a restaurant that is not open is going to cause traffic concerns, when what I heard was the real parking concerns are from the movie tavern and the shopping center. Clearly, you know, when she, when she opens this restaurant, she's going to have to make sure that she has adequate parking. Otherwise, people aren't going to come to the restaurant because if they can't get parking, then they're not going to come. So I think to talk about parking and traffic concerns now it, it, those are really things that, you know, needed to be addressed um, with the zoning, which they were, because Commissioner Burrell, one of the stipulations says that the parking plan had to be signed off. Um, but I do commend the neighbors for caring about your community. And as the chairman has said so many times, when we have public hearings, it's an opportunity for your voice to be heard. And, and that's really, you know, over this long period of time, I know you've been in multiple hearings and multiple emails and signatures and, and in your defense about the, speaking on um, Jefferson Township, you did have 600 signatures that came to the zoning hearing, but that was for the zoning. And so, um, you know, I know when you came and spoke on the zoning's behalf, you were speaking on behalf of those other neighborhoods. And like I said, I think some of the issues today is that the zoning and the alcohol kind of all got mixed together. Um, the, 
I, th I think what I heard also was that there was more concern about the um, operation and the impact of the restaurant and not a result of the alcohol. Um, alcohol doesn't cause increased traffic. Alcohol doesn't cause parking problems. Real, and what we're here to listen to today is should or should not this restaurant be given an alcohol license? Um, a lot of the concerns you have may be valid, but they were valid into whether or not the board and the other business item allowed the restaurant to come in here. And those items, I believe, were addressed very well by Commissioner Burrell in the stipulations that she did. This, this restaurant has more stipulations than any restaurant I've ever seen. And so, um, you know, Ms. Rana has her, her work cut out for her. And I mean, restaurants are difficult to run on their own, let alone with all the stipulations. And, and she made, uh, Ms. Rana made a, a tremendous effort in changing the menu. Myself and uh, my assistant looked at it. And um, I look forward to going to the restaurant too, because I think it's a very, um, it's a nice menu. And the layout that, that they have proposed um, is a restaurant. Now, as um, Mr. Mr. Hensley said, they have to follow every one of these stipulations. If they don't, it's a, a potential for $1,000 a day fine until it's corrected, or they can be shut down, or the alcohol license can be removed. Um, like I said, this, this unlike a zoning where once it's zoned, it's zoned like that forever, this is a yearly application that has to come in every year and we've seen in the past where if someone served alcohol to a minor or something like that, that the renewal of their license comes into question. And sometimes they get suspensions or in some severe cases, the board has removed an alcohol license from an establishment because they were not following the rules. Um, and, and I know that you all mentioned that you have concerns about the neighborhood having to be kind of the enforcers. Well, unfortunately, you know, there's only five of us up here and we can't go to every restaurant and every bar every single time. And part of the reason that we have public hearings, public comments, um, you, heard a, you heard a gentleman earlier who spoke about um, stipulations that were put in place with his conservation subdivision and they weren't being followed. And so he came here to the board meeting and brought his concerns so that the commissioners and staff could hear that those conditions were not being followed. Many times that's the only way that we as commissioners find out what's going on because we can't be everywhere all the time. And even David, who's here every meeting, um, telling us about the smoking ban, um, that's why we have public comment and public hearings, is for you to come and tell us those things that we may not know, or emails or phone calls. Um, so I think it's really important that you're doing that, and it's unfortunate that sometimes it has to happen that way. And, and you know that we've worked diligently trying to get the noise and the tr trash pickup and all those things with the shopping center. Um, so I personally do not have a problem issuing this alcohol license today because with what I've seen in um, them following the stipulations in here and in talking to staff, that I believe that these stipulations and conditions will um, ensure that they are an um, asset to the community and not a detriment. Um, I do not believe that the only two things on here in 106 that I believe that potentially could be an issue down the road would be um, number five, which is evidence that the license in that location would be a detriment to traffic conditions. We have to wait and see, like I mentioned earlier. Um, there, we've never really seen, or at least looking at the aerials, I don't see that, um, that this location would be a detriment to property values. Because um, I think, you know, the, the bigger issue that your neighborhood has is the movie tavern and the Firestone. Um, I think the bigger thing that this helps with is it gets rid of another empty um, shop. And with the, you know, landscaping plan that, um, that she's got planned and, and some other things. And then just a viable restaurant, I think, will be beneficial to the community. Um, what I would suggest is that when she has her grand opening, that you guys go and kind of, um, you know, work on bringing her into the community. And um, Ms. Rana, I would recommend also that when you do have your grand opening that you have the community come and so that everybody can see that, that you really do care about the community and that you want to be a part of it. So those are my comments. Mr. Burrow. Yeah. <laughs> I can't win. Oh boy. <laughs> um, as was stated, this was District 3 prior to January of this year. 
And um, when the zoning, when it came through zoning and the first um, application that was subsequently withdrawn, there, there were a lot of issues and a lot of opposition. Um, as you can see in our, in the testimony and in the letters submitted with the application, with the hearing from the LRB, um, there are 14 letters in opposition in our book. And the comments that I want to make is I dealt with the Chatsworth homeowners and other surrounding neighborhoods through the zoning and initial um, alcohol application. Um, and also code enforcement issues and that not impacted here with this application, but um, worked with the neighbors through all of that um, in the past. And um, the concerns I have are the, it's, I know that the owner stated that this, those issues were in the past and there's a new floor plan and um, application now. And um, when it came in before, there were residents affected by the under 300 foot rule. And um, it is still the same owner. The entrance was moved to allow for over the 300 feet so that it's not an automatic but you still have the opposition and the reason why we're here today hearing um, both sides. Um, and I, I, do, I do feel the concerns of the neighbors and I do think um, I understand their concern with the red flags and um, the potential of of impact, negative impact on the community. And for those reasons, I can't support this. Okay, Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. I, I guess uh, I've looked at the criteria given to us by Mr. Hensley in 6106, and like Commissioner Ott, I see nothing in there that precludes this license from being issued. I don't understand since we approved this plan in July of last year and all of these ordinances and uh, stipulations that were put in place that have been uh, followed uh, while we're even here, to be honest with you. Uh, it appears to me that it meets all our legal requirements, uh, that what they're doing is going to look a whole lot better than what's already there, that the Firestone business is already far worse than what this is going to be. Uh, now and what it's going to be in the future. And I think what is really here is using the license review board and uh, alcohol license is another uh, shot at trying to deny this restaurant. It's already been approved. And so I see no reason, again, why we're here and I support uh, issuing this license uh, without question. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cupid. Thank you. Um, I agree with Commissioner Weatherford and, and his assessment of this application. I had some procedural questions to ask, again, of the establishment to wanting to get some more data on what the percentage of alcohol was to be served versus food sales. Sometimes that's projected. Um, to get a sense of what, how closely are the issues that were presented related to alcohol versus just being related to a restaurant. You know, I can understand some of the back and forth here on the board because um, a lot of the considerations we have for zoning are also considerations in section 6-106. We do assess traffic, we do assess parking, but yet that is also included here. So um, there is some overlap and I was just trying to understand um, how parking and traffic are specifically related to alcohol with um, this license. Also uh, wanted to get some more information about the business model, you did share it, because in some of the letters that were provided, people questioned the applicant as not being forthcoming um, and um, of having some other characteristics that I think if there was some explanation about what the restaurant was doing generally, it could be considered. 
Um, the attorney did address some of those things in her opening statement, but it's my thought that opening statements are not considered evidentiary. That's just a roadmap of evidence to be presented. So should this go to a court for some reason, nobody's going to look at an opening statement and, and look at the evidence provided. The witnesses are responsible for, for, for providing that evidence. So that's my bit of concern here. But it looks as if um, there is some consensus on this board to, to support this application. I've um, tried to understand what was going on with the neighbors, to try to understand what was going on with parking so I can make sure I understood um, what was going to be um, what was going to be impacted by this business coming here, and I appreciate you answering those questions. Um, I can't say parking is not going to be an issue. It looks as if it is an issue. Um, the, the traffic engineer provided some compelling evidence with respect to traffic, but I'm just I don't know specifically about parking, and I don't know exactly how to consider that, considering there was an approved other business application where the um, district commissioner. I think has to look at the parking plan, but section 6-106 also asks us to consider whether or not there is gonna be a detriment to traffic or is there gonna be a lack of sufficient parking. So I don't want to exclude that. Um, ho however, I, I um, you know, I, there is opportunity for that to be addressed by future applications. And um, it was stated that the applicant has to come in year after year to renew their um, application. So um, overall, I wish the applicant the best of luck. I Again, I um, want to support a comment that was shared by Commissioner Ah that the applicant did take time to renew their application to make sure that she was being responsive to the community concerns, and that's to be commended because that doesn't always happen. And at the end of the day, um, I hope that there's a partnership not just with you and the community, but with you and Cobb County. We want people to think that they can open a successful business here and be supported by, by Cobb County. In the same respects, we want to ensure that businesses are operating in compliance with our laws. But um, one thing that you didn't, that the witness didn't flesh out, but her family and the witness seem to have some experience operating other establishments, and we hope that that will lend itself to you. Um, operating this site responsibly. So with that, I'm, I'm inclined to support this application. Okay, so a vote yes is to support, is to approve the liquor license. Okay, I, I know, I just wanna make sure I get clarity here. So when he makes the motion to support, it'll be yes to be to support the liquor license and no would be to deny, right? Okay, all right, I just wanna make sure. All right. Um, I just want to make one more comment I forgot to mention. I just want to thank the members of the License Review Board. I think part of the reason when you asked Commissioner Weatherford why are we here, they saw that this was a more difficult case than the ones they normally deal with. And I think because there was opposition that came to speak in front of them, I think they wanted to give the opposition the opportunity to come in front of the board. Because they could have just approved it and these folks would not have had the opportunity to come in front of this board. Whereas by denying it, even though, as um, Sam Hensley said, there was really no, you know, things that didn't meet our code, I think that they were giving, and I commend them for that, they were giving, you know, the folks that wanted to speak to us the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, unfortunately, it takes some time, but, but you know, I think it's important for us to be able to hear from them. So with that, I make a motion to approve the alcohol license. Um, and Sam, it's just the normal yearly basis renewal, right? Yeah, so um, approve the alcohol license for, um, let me find their name again. Uh, can we have the name? No, 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 but it's, it's, it's for the restaurant, right? It's for the restaurant? Paprika. Paprika. Yeah, but, but, but it's, you mentioned something else first. Casba Corporation. Casbah, yeah, Casba, that's what it was. Corporation Limited doing right, business as okay. Paprika. So uh, issue the alcohol license um, for Casba Corporation Limited doing business as uh, Paprika. Okay, we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Call the question. It passes four to one with uh, Commission Berlin opposition. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. All right, and we have uh, Commissioner comments, I believe now, right? Okay, Commissioner, oh, I'll let you start out today. All right. 
Um, I've got a couple things to announce that are going on in the district. Um, the first one coming up is uh, this Thursday, October 12th, at um, Old Town Athletic Club. And that is a uh, public safety appreciation dinner for the police uh, in Precinct 4. If you would like to sponsor a seat, um, you can contact the office and we'll get you in touch with the folks that are setting it up. Um, that's at 6 o'clock on Thursday night. Um, also coming up on October 19th at 1130, um, Sage Restaurant, Wood Fire Grill on uh, Windy Hill and Power Spray will be doing the ribbon cutting. Um, on the same day that night, also at Old Town Athletic Club, uh, East Cobb Wine and Vine Market will be from 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock, and that um, is by the Civitans, and um, the proceeds go towards the East Cobb Park. Um, on October 25th, Powers Ferry Community Alliance will have their annual meeting at the Brumby Elementary School, and that starts at 7 o'clock. And the final thing, this is for you, Commissioner Weatherford. What are you doing? Well, I just, I brought you the uh, necessary equipment that you would need for the uh, next event that's happening at SunTrust Park on October 25th through the 29th. Here? No, it is a golf club and a visor because you will be able to tee off at SunTrust Park um, they're going to set up nine holes around the upper deck uh -huh. with holes out in the outfield, and you will be able to use Mizuno clubs. And You'll need a bigger club for him. Uh, are you notifying all the people in the gallery across the state that, I, <laughs> that We I are be, giving them fair warning. I may be hitting it the wrong way. <laughs> we will have to be using the reader board signs to make sure they know that you are anywhere near. How many LAZs can I break? <laughs> but from October 25th to the 29th, um, there will be a tee off at SunTrust Park. And that's all I have. Uh, can't top that one. <laughs> Commissioner Burrow. Um, well, first I want to congratulate all the public safety officers and that received awards at the uh, chamber breakfast a week ago, Monday. And I think Commissioner Weatherford will probably expand on that since he's public safety this year. Um, tomorrow at the East Cobb Senior Center, there is a fundraiser. Have lunch and dinner at Teriyaki Madness tomorrow, October 11th, um, from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Go by the East Cobb Senior Center at, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's at the restaurant, Teriyaki Madness at the at, um, Sandy Plains Center, 2960 Shalliford Road. But if you go by there, take there's some flyers in the back, and a dollar from every meal will support the East Cobb Senior Center. I'm sorry, I thought it was at the Senior Center, but it's at the restaurant. Um, later this month on Monday, October 23rd, is annual diaper day. Um, th this started in 2009, and they're accepting diapers of all sizes for children, for um, organizations in Cobb uh, that benefit from this. Uh, Must Ministries, Live Safe Resources, Center for Family Resources, Simple Needs, Georgia, and Sweetwater Mission. And this year, I'm proud to say that our Community Development Department will be um, collecting diapers beginning yesterday, Monday, October 9th, through Friday, October 20th. So you can drop off your packages of diapers to Community Development Office, and they will be just taking them over to um, the Square Marietta on Diaper Day, October 23rd. And we appreciate your support of that to our Community Development Office. Um, and also on October 22nd, uh, United Milita Military Care is sponsoring an open house. They are located at 1220 Old Canton Road in Marietta. You can stop by, see who they are, a nonprofit, 
and what they do and how they serve our military families and veterans. The open house is Sunday, October 22nd from 2 to 7 p.m. Again at 1220 Old Canton Road in Marietta. Um, and then last but not least, the next Forever Fest at the Animal Shelter is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on November 4th, Saturday, November 4th, 1060 Al Bishop Drive. Please go by, see what dogs and cats are up for adoption, and take home your new best friend. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Weatherford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As Commissioner Burrell mentioned, uh, there are a lot of public safety events going on. Last week was Public Safety Week, and many of us had the opportunity to go to the chamber where they were given awards and appreciation and thanks. Uh, there were many acts of valor, many acts of going above and beyond uh, normal duties, and it makes us all proud to have such a public safety department here in Cobb County. Uh, this week is Fire Prevention Week, so if you would like to get some information on that, uh, that is firepreventionweek.org, so that will be going on this week. Monday is a rain date for the Public Safety Foundation Golf Tournament, which I apparently will need to practice now <laughs> in order to meet Chairman, uh, I mean, Mr. Ott's uh, challenge. And they're still looking for any sponsors, players, or auction items. That's a great event every year. It's held at... Uh, at Brookstone, and it'll be a great event for everyone. And along with the lines of going above and beyond, our uh, Cobb firefighters participated uh, in an event in the area, uh, greater Atlanta area, to raise money for the firemen that were affected by Hurricane Harvey in Houston. The three-day boot drive raised over $250,000 from 14 different departments in the metro area, and our department, our fire department, uh, collected over 60000 of that money. So kudos to the fire department and their reaching out and going above and beyond and being more than just the face at the other end when you need them, but giving back to our community. Thank you, sir. Okay. Commissioner Cupid. Thank you, Chairman. I want to publicly thank Sharon Mashburn with Juvenile Court. Um, she's a probation uh, supervisor with their gang program. She came and spoke at my last town hall meeting and shared a lot of information about how parents can uh, assess whether or not their child is involved in gang activity or not. She also provided some other resources that juvenile court is providing to help kids just stay clear of the legal system in general. So I wanted to let parents who may be struggling with the young one um, wanted to let you know that um, there are resources for you to um, help your child get the assistance that they need through the juvenile court proactively before they get involved in um, anything that could cause them to be on the other side of the law. Um, want to share that um, tomorrow I'll have my community zoning meeting again for the Austell and Powder Springs cases, and that will be at the South Cobb Recreation Center at 6 p.m. Finally, I hate to share um, this news, but my assistant, Bianca Keaton, who's been with me since, um, I guess, three years now, since 2014, she will be leaving the county um, on October 20th. I've had a great ride with her. She's done a lot and continues to do a lot for the district and the county. Um, it's been a lot for her to juggle the commute between Gwinnett County and Cobb County every day on top of having a beautiful baby girl, which was um, born two years ago. And I can certainly understand all that she's done to um, well serve the constituents of District 4 and Cobb in the midst of all of those other um, things that she has on her plate. Um, Bianca's not here um, in our meeting room today. She's probably watching by um, computer, but just want to thank you publicly. I know our constituents will look forward to thanking you more, so please reach out to her by phone or email. And it is our plan to have something for her next week, Friday, October 20th at 2 p.m. Our, our location is still to be determined, but I hope to get that out to you um, via our newsletter so that we can um, send her off very well. That's it. Thank you. And with that, I call this meeting to an adjournment. Thank you.